Here's the latest. Chad Daybell, several police officers are allegedly in the courtroom. This comes from someone that is there. Uh, three to five members of the public and Chad um, all just walked in. He is wearing foot shackles, white shirt, light blue tie. I think we'll be starting soon. In other words, uh, that started out with uh, something that I thought might be something else, a bunch of police officers, but it sounds like they're just bringing Chad Daybell in. So that's the latest. Oh boy, something just came down, guys. Something just came down. Okay, this just came down. Are you guys okay? While we wait, and it, whenever it starts, we'll go there. But this just came down. Um, it sounds like the there is no court order restricting contact between the defendant and his co-defendant filed November 13th, 2023. Um, but the Fremont County, the Fremont County case, they jo were joined for trial. The court upon motion entered an order denying the respective defendants motions for joint strategy sessions, including the request for the court to authorize then joint defendants to meet alone in a room and also jointly with their attorneys. The court denied the request. However, the court never entered any order prohibiting communication between Chad Dable and Lori Vallow Dable. Accordingly, the court confirms there is no order in this case precluding communication between Chad Dabell and Lori Vallow Dabell. The foregoing reasons the state's motion is granted. Wowza. So, in other words, Lori and Chad Dabell can correspond. That's pretty interesting to me if uh, Chad's trying to throw Lori under the bus. What's he telling her? He's that he's that dude. He's that dude we all dated, right? Telling her one thing, babe, it's going to be okay. I'm going to get us out of this. And then he's going to go talk to John Pryor and be like, I don't, you just blame everything on her. We've all dated that guy. And you know, he does that. He does that a lot. He did it to Julie Rowe. He did it to his wife of nearly 30 years when uh, women. Okay, guys, we're on. Here we go. Here we go. We're on. We'll start then with procedurally on the motion. The court had entered a order in the what used to be the companion case of 22-21-16-24 State versus Lori Vallow, and that applied to both cases. The court thereafter had concluded that when that trial was complete, the issue of coverage would be reconsidered here, uh, mostly for the reason that there was a mutual request in the Lori Vallow case, which the court considered, and the parties are in a different posture here where the defense has requested that the court permit uh, photography or video of the trial here, Mr. Pryor on behalf of his client, and we're at different proceedings, a different case now, and that other case has been concluded. So based on that, the court mentioned to counsel in a status conference that we would address the issue today. And then I issued an order on October 11th that we would hear argument on the issue today concerning camera coverage of this case continuing as well as the trial that's scheduled for March of 2024. So, at this time, uh, the court would note I have reviewed the briefs. I'll begin with the state's argument on the issue here. After that, I'll hear from the defense, Mr. Pryor, and then finally after that, Ms. Olson, if you'd like to make any argument on behalf of your clients, you can do that. Mr. Wood. Your Honor, respectfully, I'd actually ask that we reverse that order. This is technically the defendant's motion. Uh, and then uh, the interested party agrees with the defendant. Uh, the state is in a responsive posture. We'd ask to be able to uh, go after them to be able to respond. That being said, if you want me to go first, I can go first. I just think that would be the appropriate manner to proceed in. All right, and I don't mind switching the order given that. Mr. Pryor, your thoughts? Well, Judge, my thoughts are simply this, is that uh, unlike the change of venue, which was the prosecuting attorney trying to uh, have the court reconsider a motion without any lawful authority because in the venue there is no lawful authority for them to hear a motion to reconsider in this particular case 
it was the court's own initiative that said that given the posture that they would do a motion to reconsider and the court is well within its right to do that. In essence, what it is, Judge, is it's, it's a first time motion to allow cameras. And as such, I think that it's proper that the state go first and followed by the defense and Ms. Olson. All right. Uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure that the order matters that much in terms of uh, how per persuasive the arguments would be. I would note it was the court that raised the issue, sua sponte, in its order uh, to review the issue, given where we're at. Uh, Mr. Wood, I'll hear your argument at this point, and then I will hear the response from the others. I'll allow a rebuttal, however, after they've made their arguments. So if you'd like to present argument now, you can. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the motion before the court is whether or not we allow live broadcasting or cameras into the courtroom. Um, and I want to start out, uh, I understand these are adversarial proceedings. We do not, the state does not see the media in any way as an adversary. Uh, we are grateful for the media. We respect the media. Uh, there's a reason why the right to a free press is in our constitution and one of the first things mentioned in the Bill of Rights. Uh, we understand they have an important role in uh, preserving government transparency. They have an important role in informing the public. Uh, and so we, we do respect them. We, uh, this argument is not at all about whether or not the media should be allowed in, in the courtroom. They should be allowed. Uh, and we're, we're glad they're there. Uh, in terms of broadcasting uh, the trial, in term, and we're gonna, the state at least is going to address broadcasting the trial and broadcasting any further uh, pretrial hearings. Uh, we shouldn't fix what isn't broken. This court made a very good decision. Uh, I believe it was in September or October of uh, proceeding of last year. And we think the court was correct when it made that decision. Uh, we think that that decision led to more professional proceedings and, and helped in preserving the rights to the parties, the rights of the parties to a fair trial. Um, again, we're not arguing that the media should not be allowed in the courtroom. Uh, in our brief, we, we talk about that. The right of the public and media is um, uh, important in, in the courtroom. This specific issue is addressed in an Idaho Court Administrative Rule 45. This, uh, this court has sole discretion over this matter. Um, it's not even appealable uh, by any of the parties. So the, the state has raised these issues several times. We actually raised this in the previous case before a preliminary hearing. Uh, our concern, I'm gonna talk quickly about pretrial hearings. Uh, pretrial publicity can impede the ability of the parties to a fair and impartial trial. Uh, this cannot be denied and um, it rose its head in the last trial. Uh, individuals who had seen specific uh, media programs were automatically cut from the jury. Um, we expect that issue will be raised again. Um, and while the state doesn't necessarily agree with a wholesale cutting those individuals out, uh, we understand the concern of when someone has consumed too much media about a case that it may make it difficult for them to uh, render a fair and impartial verdict. And so in terms of at least pre-trial hearings from here until the trial. Uh, the state's biggest concern there, and, and this might be our biggest concern overall, is if any of those hearings deal with evidence that we will be discussing at trial. Uh, we believe that by broadcasting it, um, it makes it even easy, more easy to consume by the public, by the mass public, and creates further issues when picking a jury. And again, we've already seen it. This isn't a hypothetical, it's happened. Uh, there's no reason to believe it won't happen again. Um, again, we're not saying the media shouldn't be allowed to report. They should, that's important. Uh, there is a difference between reporting though and the ability to live broadcast. Uh, 
And there's nothing in the law that states that they have to be able to live broadcast. In terms of trial, um, and I don't wanna uh, regurgitate everything that I, I, all the issues I raised in my briefing, uh, there's a lot of people who are called to witnesses in this case who want nothing to do with it. They're not there because they wanna be. They didn't get dragged into a triple murder, horrible case, a sordid case, because they wanted to be a part of it. And the state is concerned, and we think validly so, about the effect on witnesses of knowing their face is being plastered on TV for millions of people to see. It's already hard enough to get on a witness stand, be placed under oath, and, and then to be direct examined, to be cross-examined, trial gets aggressive, and then to have that added pressure of knowing my next door neighbor can watch this. The people I go to church with can watch this. It's not, it's not conducive, especially in a case like this, to a fair trial for either of the parties. We understand that the defendant has a, a different position on that. We believe strongly that having the live broadcasting this trial only makes it more difficult to get to the truth of the matter. Uh, we, as stated before, we do not believe that visual broadcasting is necessary for a transparent and a public trial. We believe in an open and public trial. Transparency does not require mass publicity. And there's no rule, there's no law that says that it does. Um, and I would note, and I, I put this in my brief, um, at the last trial, at Lori's trial, uh, there was a lot of reporting and it was minute by minute. Uh, I, I, I called it live tweeting. I don't know if there's a specific other phrase for that, uh, but where uh, multiple reporters in the courtroom or in the, the uh, auxiliary room were able to live tweet. And that was great. I, I fully support that. and. In as much as we are able to follow it, uh, it appeared to be very accurate and timely. And so the public, the interested public, was able to follow by the minute what was happening in the trial. They didn't need to watch it. They still got that information. And again, as far as the state could tell, it was accurate information. Um, it was a job well done by the individuals reporting on the case. And so not only that, there's a transcript. People can obtain the transcript. There was an audio recording that was provided at the end of each day. And so in terms of a transparent and public trial, we don't have to point cameras in people's faces for the trial to be open, transparent, and public. Um, I would quickly note, we are the state is aware, um, many of the victims in this case feel differently than the state. Uh, I know there was news articles about that last time. We respect, we, we don't technically represent the victims. We respect them and their desires and it's appropriate for the court to know they don't necessarily agree with us on this. Um, and so if we, if we keep the status quo, if we keep it where it's at, there's no risk of a non-public trial. There's no risk of a non-transparent trial. Uh, the state doesn't see an upside uh, to bringing cameras into the courtroom. It worked well the last time. Again, we shouldn't fix what isn't broken. Uh, and I put this in my brief, and if the court uh, decides to change its decision, uh, we respectfully request a few things. We would ask, uh, and this hasn't been an issue lately, and it wasn't an issue at la the last trial, uh, but just, I guess, preemptively, uh, we would specifically request that no media microphones be placed at counsel's table as took place in some of the other pretrial hearings. Uh, we believe that violates uh, Idaho Court Administrative Rule 45C, or at least has a, a very grave ability to uh, violate that rule. We would ask that the court consider alternatives to live visual broadcasting, such as still photography. Uh, and should the court allow visual broadcasting, we would ask that the court uh, essentially retain tight control on that, at least while it's being done, as this court is aware, once video is made 
and public, the court loses any and all control by rule over what happens with it. But we would ask that the camera placement be limited. Uh, we think a good model would be uh, Ms. Vallow or Ms. Daybell's sentencing in which uh, I believe there was a camera on the court and a cam one camera pointing at the parties. Uh, there was no zooming in on attorneys, on witnesses, on, uh, um, on victims. And so we would ask that if the court does change its decision, that it do so uh, within that framework to maintain uh, the fairness of the trial. Again, we do not believe that live broadcasting is necessary. Um, thank you. All right, thank you for the argument, Mr. Wood. Mr. Pryor. Judge, the, uh, the primary reason for Mr. Daybell requesting the cameras is uh, to allow his family to view the proceedings. Um, they would like the opportunity to watch on TV and to see how the trial transpires. And, and those uh, children that aren't going to be witnesses would like to be able to do that. It's extended extended family as well. That's our primary reason for doing that. I'm concerned about live streaming because uh, that allows, um, in my opinion, less control. Uh, cameras in addition um, in the courtroom we'd lose a little bit of control as well. But I'd be more concerned about a cameraman who's, while this thing has been proceeding, has snapped a thousand pictures of me and Chad while we're sitting here. Uh, that's a bigger concern for me than, than the actual cameras. Uh, we can't control what this cameraman's doing and the pictures he's taken, he's been snipping along and, and, and I'm sure I'll be seeing them with uh, Mr. Eaton's website uh, later today or tomorrow. The court, however, can put some conditions on a live camera. And on a live camera, like Mr. Wood pointed out, and I wholeheartedly, and quite frankly, Mr. Wood, I agree almost with everything you say. Uh, he makes a good valid argument, Judge. However, um, the overriding concern is that when our founding fathers started the process of deciding that there would be a public trial, we didn't have cameras. We didn't have uh, ability to broadcast this. And the idea behind a public trial was that if you brought allegations against someone and they wanted to answer those allegations, they should be able to do that in a public forum. And the stay of media and the amount of attention, and you know, and, and I do disagree with Mr. Wood, East Idaho has been saturated with media attention on this case. And, uh, but um, the reality is this is a national case. It has garnered tremendous attention. And a public trial is just not limited to people coming from Fremont County to sit in the courtroom and watch the proceedings. And having sat through the entire trial of Lori Vallow and watched the entire proceeding, uh, there were issues with the live feed. I'm opposed to the live feed. I just didn't think it worked. It wasn't pragmatic, it wasn't practical. I think that let's use the professionals who know how to do this. Uh, I don't like the idea of a camera being pointed in my face for what's going to end up being eight to 10 weeks. Uh, I, I dislike even more a, a, a photographer taking pictures of me while we're sitting here. Uh, and I'd much rather have a cameraman to, uh, with that. And Mr. Wood pointed out some of the restrictions that we could apply. And I agree with what he said. No mics at the tables. I guess if you have to point the camera at uh, Mr. Daybell and I, go ahead and Mr. Wood and his group uh, as well and uh, at the witnesses. But part of the reason behind a public trial judge is accountability. And that's a big overriding factor. And when you're talking about due process and people having a fair right to a public trial, accountability is important. And as much as I don't like the idea of being on live TV, national TV, and I, I, I don't like the idea of it at all, um, the reality is it keeps everybody honest. It keeps the system honest. It keeps the witnesses honest. It keeps everybody honest. And the very thing, I'll disagree with Mr. Wood in just this regard. The fact that you have a camera on you, the fact that people are watching this in a public, much like in when our founding fathers, you had to answer questions in a public forum. That makes the system honest. 
And that really is, is what the driving force judge is allow the public to see this in an honest way, be able to see the entire evidence, not what press releases that people are releasing, not what certain news media report. Let's allow the public to see this in a public way and allow what really is a pub, should be a public trial. And, and, and again, uh, allowing Mr. Daybell's family to review the proceedings. Uh, you could imagine, Judge, that if they show up to court, they, they would be inundated, whether it was here or anybody else, with, with the media uh, hounding them and, and the victims as well, and everybody else who's involved in this, uh, um, allowing them people to watch this in a public setting. There is one caveat. Um, by doing this in a public with, with live cameras judge, that does create a concern for whether or not anybody witnesses are watching the proceedings. And I guess I don't know how the court would address that. And that's something the court does need to look at. So that doesn't change my position that we, I believe it should be a public hearing with cameras, but controlling how witnesses are limited in, in watching the media and maybe a, the prosecutors and I could work out something with all of our witnesses saying, you know, absolutely no opportunities to view this. If the court allows us to be a public trial with cameras, it's going to have to be some program in order that advises all of the witnesses that they are not under any circumstances to review the proceedings or view the proceedings. So that is a concern of mine, but uh, I still stick with our original position that we, we need to have cameras in the courtroom, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Morning, Ms. Olson. Uh, I'll note now we'll hear argument from uh, Attorney Wendy Olson, who's representing EastIdahoNews.com, the Idaho Statesman, Idaho Press Club, and States Newsroom doing business as Idaho Capital Sun. Uh, brief's been filed. The court's reviewed that. And if you'd like to present argument in support of your position, you can do so at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and thank you for allowing uh, my clients to be heard this morning. As the court noted, the clients are three Idaho-based news entities, and then the Idaho Press Club, which is an association of journalists uh, who work on a variety of First Amendment matters to ensure that they can, they can have complete coverage of um, matters of important interest in the state of Idaho. Your Honor, the entities request the ability to have live audio and visual coverage of the proceedings in this case, consistent with Idaho administrative, uh, Idaho Court Administrative Rule 45, in a way that will allow the defendant and the state to have their constitutional interests protected in a way that is designed to um, respect the privacy concerns of jurors and the sensitivities of witnesses, and to really observe the dignity of the courtroom. And I think, Your Honor, that the um, media entities uh, that are before you here have done that in other cases, and they would want to work with the court on any restrictions the court thinks is important to maintain the dignity of the courtroom, to ensure that sensitive witnesses, um, maybe their, only their um, audio is heard at the time. They would want to work with the court to ensure that whatever guidelines the court imposes, that they would follow. But they think it's important to have cameras in the courtroom and have live audio visual coverage of the proceedings for several reasons. Primarily among them, Your Honor, it's a, the point that Mr. Pryor touched on is that we are in an age now where visual coverage of just about every aspect of public life is there, where people really have the opportunity to see with their own eyes, not by sitting in a courtroom, but by sitting in their living rooms or sitting in their offices to watch those proceedings. Um, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial had extensive coverage, TV coverage. Um, certainly the Derek Chauvin case did. That started out of COVID, but, but the, uh, the judge after that realized the importance of having cameras in the courtroom. And then more recently, the Alex Murdoch trial in South Carolina, where those coverages, the coverage there was basically from the opening of the trial through some through the sentencing. And I think that the coverage in those cases showed how with guidelines from the court, uh, it allows the public to observe firsthand what goes on in the courtroom. I know the court indicated that you read our submittals, our pleadings. I would also ask the court to take particular note of Becky Boone, Rebecca Boone's declaration, and where she talks about, she's worked with Idaho courts, Idaho journalists, the law school, to try to improve coverage of our court system. 
We learn a lot in the public about the executive branch and the legislative branch, but less is known about the judicial branch and how it operates. And I think it's important for people to be able to see firsthand what happens in a trial. How is evidence presented? Um, I think it's important to the point that Mr. Wood raised that it's important for them to see the impact that participating in a trial demands from the people who participate in it. It is no doubt, Your Honor, that the criminal justice system, the system that I participated in for most of my legal career, is very hard on the participants. It demands a lot of people. It demands a lot of the lawyers, the court, of the jurors, of the witnesses, of the family members. And I think that covering the, the proceedings live will allow the public to understand that better because it is still a relatively rare thing for people to have firsthand involvement in any aspect of court proceedings. I think secondly, Your Honor, why it would be important and helpful to the court to have live audio and visual coverage is it would reduce the demand, frankly, for space in the courtroom. Um, it's my understanding that the attendance at this hearing by the public is less than in past hearings, and maybe that's because the court elected to um, broadcast this live through its the YouTube channel that the courts have used. Um, certainly, that will help the court with security and with other administrative needs and getting the trial done in a way that is that is most efficient. And so we think for that reason as well, it would be important to have uh, live audio and visual coverage of the proceedings. Um, and, and finally, Your Honor, with respect to how that is done, again, the media organizations want to make sure that they are working with the court on all of those things. And I know that the proceedings are being done through the court's uh, technology today, but I would invite the court to, to not do it that way at the trial if, if the court allows visual proceedings. And that's really for for several reasons, Your Honor. Reasons, Your Honor. Uh, first, it is because the the journalists who are experienced camera operators, typically who will do the the court the uh, pool reporting, uh, they have more sensitive cameras, uh, better cameras, and more sensitive microphones that could be placed you know, not at council table but somewhere else if that is the court's uh, direction. Um, in addition, Your Honor, the the court would not have to worry about whether or not there are any technical glitches if the cameras are being operated by the pool camera reporter. Um, of course, I, the, neither the parties, nor the court, nor the jurors, nor anybody would want to have interruptions during the proceedings because there was some glitch in the technology. Um, and, and then I think, Your Honor, uh, again, with having the uh, members of the press who are experts in operating their camera, um, you know, they would work with the court to ensure that there isn't anything unnecessarily intrusive if they were the ones to operate uh, operate the equipment, as was done, I think, at Ms. Vallow's uh, sentencing. And so I think for all of those reasons, Your Honor, our clients would like to see the live audio and visual coverage of the proceedings. I, I well understand, too, uh, both Mr. Pryor's and Mr. Wood's concerns about witnesses uh, watching things that they should not watch before they testify. There's uh, nothing sort of less comfortable as a prosecutor to know your, your witnesses have you know, received outside information, um, and then that comes in at cross-examination. And of course, uh, we want to make sure the jurors aren't uh, watching the proceedings. With respect to the jurors, Your Honor, and them reading coverage of the case once they've been set, that's a concern in every trial. The court gives firm instructions about that. And I think as media has evolved, the court's instructions on those issues have had to change over time to include, for example, social media. I know in the federal courts, there's a social media instruction that's given all the time now about don't look at social media when you're uh, a member of the jury, and, and this court can certainly craft instructions uh, that would cover all of the concerns the court would have with respect to the jurors potentially watching uh, anything that comes from the live audio and visual coverage of the trial. Of course, hopefully they wouldn't be watching while the trial was going on. Um, and, and then, Your Honor, with respect to the witnesses, it really was incumbent upon the parties, and Mr. Pryor alluded to it, to, to speak to their witnesses and firmly instruct them not to watch and not to be influenced by any other evidence. It's no different than, than telling them don't talk to other witnesses about their testimony. It's important that their testimony be from their own independent recollection. And, and those are um, challenges that are present in every kind of case. And here they're even more so because of the, the prior trial of Ms. Uh, Daybell. And so we would ask the court that in considering those factors, um, do the things that the court and the parties typically do, which is to give very firm instructions. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, I do have a few questions for you, Ms. Sure. Uh, reading through your brief, uh, you go through some policy arguments about why it's important to have cameras in the courtroom for these proceedings. 
Uh, one of your captions is it will help enhance the public's understanding of court proceedings and promote respect for the rule of law. Uh, I'll note in my background, I did some federal criminal defense work as a CJA attorney for about 15 years. And I believe you were the US attorney for Idaho during the time I was CJA attorney. In the federal courts, they simply have a rule 53 that there is no permitting of any photographs any video at all in any federal proceeding. Is that your understanding of how the federal system works? It, it absolutely is, Your Honor. And I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that that rule will be changing some. I think it takes sort of a major case with a lot of public interest to, to move things that direction. And I suspect that the uh, uh, federal charges pending against Donald Trump and others, there is now a lot more just discussion in the media about changing that rule. One of the things we cited for the court was um, a poll about people wanting to see live live coverage of oral arguments in the Supreme Court. I understand that appellate arguments are different animals from criminal trials, but I think the federal system is far behind the state system in terms of allowing uh, coverage of what goes on in in trials. Okay. Well, I just I want to understand that because uh, Idaho leaves it at the discretion of the judge under Rule 45. Some other states uh, want cameras in and have rules governing that. Uh, the, the entire federal system completely bans cameras, and there are high-profile, important criminal cases of great public interest occurring all the time in the federal system. Would you agree with that? I, I agree, Your Honor. And, and in all of those proceedings, there are never cameras because it's prohibited by federal rule. And so the policy arguments that the public is not going to have confidence in this case or an understanding of what's happening... Uh, I just wonder how that's squared with whatever policy drives the federal courts to just simply disallow cameras and take it out of the judge's hand. Um, don't you think, in fact, the public can still have that same type of confidence in the proceedings and understanding if they want to come and sit in and watch a trial as they do in any federal case? Yes, Your Honor. I think certainly people who come and watch trials and see sort of firsthand what is going on, and we certainly had those in the federal, we had people who were just sort of trial watchers who would come and, and watch every trial, and particularly the ones that add a little bit more notoriety. And certainly those individuals well understood what was going on in the courtroom. Not everyone can do that um, in every case. And as Mr. Pryor has outlined here, um, the family members of Mr. Daybell are not able to travel to Boise for a 10-week trial. And I understand there's a motion pending to, to change that but for now in Boise. And, and I think you know, the, obviously the federal government is not always ahead uh, on policy issues of, of state courts or state governments on anything. And I think, Your Honor, my understanding is the federal rule is largely driven by uh, the federal judiciary and wanting to, to ensure there are no cameras in the courtroom. And I think that will be changing as well, Your Honor. I, I think we're in a day and age where it is just the case that people want to see it with their own eyes. And federal courts are behind the times on that. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done by people in the federal system, uh, whether it's judges or former U.S. attorneys or criminal defense attorneys, to be able to articulate what goes on in those criminal courts. And there just isn't that, under, I don't think, as good of an understanding. And I do think there, there have been concerns expressed about outcomes in criminal cases and what it means. And there's a lot less direct information available for people to base that on. Well, uh, Ms. Olson, I really appreciate your comments on that. It's really interesting to hear your perspective, having been on both sides of state and federal uh, litigation and this issue. Clearly, there are policies in place uh, in our state courts that uh, maybe are different than they are in the federal courts. So uh, thank you for the well-briefed uh, argument and your oral argument today. And I thank you, Your Honor, for the opportunity uh, to present argument and the opportunity to appear in Fremont County, which is a great courthouse. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Mr. Wood, I will allow a rebuttal argument just from the state at this juncture based on the posture of the case and the comments you made at the beginning. If you have any rebuttal, uh, it's not required, but if there's anything you'd like to add, I'll hear that now. Just just very briefly and or add. Appreciate counsel's comments. Um, Mr. Pryor did bring up a point that I, I put in the brief but did not bring up, but it is important to note. Um, and Ms. Olson direct, uh, addressed it as well. Uh, 
by and the state's position is by broadcasting a trial it only makes it easier for potential witnesses to make a mistake of seeing something they shouldn't see of hearing something they shouldn't hear at the last trial uh this issue this this issue came up with a few witnesses uh, and that was just the audio uh, the state sends out something with every subpoena uh, we communicate to every single witness you're not to watch or listen to any of this trial um sometimes things still happen and then we have to deal with that in court and we have to it takes time away from the jury it takes time away from litigating the case this is a long trial uh I don't know if it's her, true. I've heard that uh, the other the preceding trial in this case was the longest criminal case in Idaho state history. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that. This is, uh, but this will also be a very long trial. This will probably be a longer trial. Uh, broadcasting that length of a trial, we just really run the risk, no matter what we say to witnesses, of people hearing things, seeing things they shouldn't. Um, I know. Uh, just a couple of things from Ms. Olson's comments. Um, and I, I'm probably not gonna, I probably didn't write this down exactly how she said it, but she mentioned that we live in a day and age of visual coverage of everyday life. I don't know that that's really an argument for broadcasting a trial. I don't, I don't know that that's a good thing. And we could probably spend hours talking about all the social implications of the fact that we live in a day and age where everything is televised or Put on a computer or a, or a phone and uh, there's videos of everything everybody does I, I don't know that that's really an argument that we should contribute to that uh, i don't i don't think i don't think it's a good thing uh, i don't think it's a good thing to turn things turn everyday life into a circus and I, I think that broadcasting even if done responsibly and respectfully will contribute to that and i just finally end on noting she mentioned the, the Kyle Rittenhouse case. I brought this up the last time we litigated this. It's interesting because that judge said afterwards, and I quote, I'm going to think long and hard about a live television trial again next time. I don't know. I've always been a firm believer in it because I think the people should be able to see what's going on. But when I see what's being done, it's really quite frightening. That was Judge Schroeder from the Kyle Rittenhouse case. My understanding is that uh, he said that in regards to the context of a jury bus being followed by some reporters. Um, and we're certainly not alleging that any of Ms. Olson's clients are going to do that. But the reality is, is by broadcasting, uh, you do, we will, we absolutely will create more of this circus type environment, more of this reality TV environment, uh, this true crime obsession. Um, again, we believe the media should be there. They should report. They have a right to be there, and the public has a right to have the media there. The public has a right to an open trial. Uh, we would ask the court to maintain its current order. We, we believe it was a good decision then, and all the reasons uh, that it made that decision then still apply today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. All right, Council, I've been uh, considering the decision on this issue. I am prepared to make a ruling today. However, I do want to take a quick recess to sort of gather my thoughts and prepare for the ruling on the motions. So we'll take a recess here for about 10 minutes or so, and then I'll come back on the bench with the ruling. Uh, let me tell you, this is a big deal for me, not that um, I matter here, but just so you guys know, because I'm going to cover this trial, no matter what, um, if if they ban cameras again, as they did with Lori Vallow Daybell's trial, I will be going to Idaho and I will be in court every day and I will be doing my lunch lives and my lives during recesses like this. If uh, they allow cameras in the courtroom. I think that we will cover the trial just like we are here with all of you. I'll be here. We will watch it all day, every day, and I will sit with you and I will not uh, fly to Idaho. We'll do it right here from home. So uh, whatever he decides, I just want you to know that Hidden True Crime will be, uh, we will be following the trial and reporting on it. Okay. So 
What do you guys think, by the way, the conclusion is going to be? I'll tell you, this, the bottom line is um, there's a precedent set. Lori Vallow did not have cameras in the courtroom. And it's true that back then everyone sort of agreed. Um, Archibald, Lori's counsel, didn't really want cameras. But Judge Boyce made that decision in the end. And because Judge Boyce set that precedent, my, I think, like, let's speculate here since we're on break together. I think that Judge Boyce is going to continue in that decision. Um, why change things? He, it, it actually, it was hard. It, it was a hard thing to manage and get used to. And then everybody got in the flow after six weeks of trial. And I think that Judge Boyce, because he made that decision once, and these are co-defendants, that he is going to make it again. The difference, of course, is that in this situation, Chad Daybell, the defendant, is okay with cameras, uh, meaning his attorney is okay, is okay with cameras, whether or not Chad's saying that he's the one that wants cameras or if John Pryor is telling Chad, trust me, you want cameras, I don't know. But Chad Daybell and his counsel are good with cameras. So that changes things a bit. But I'd love to know your thoughts here in chat, and I'll pin some of Jam, I agree. I think cameras need to be limited too. I will say one thing that has disappointed me in certain media outlets, um, that they will zoom in the entire time on the defendant's face, Lori Vallow, Chad Dable, and not just in this case, in, in, in any case, uh, or any trial is what I mean. And I do think that we need to show a bit more respect and show the entire courtroom the the reason for cameras is not to focus in on the defendant uh, and close up and, uh, you know, criticize every brow furrow that they make. And although everyone sort of wants that, that's not what cameras are for. Cameras are for transparency, not to nitpick every facial expression. I do believe that there needs to be more respect shown in courts with cameras and the, the court's camera right now, for example, is a good example of how they show everything in court. There is a lot of transparency. We see the judge and we see the entire courtroom. I think that's a good example of how cameras can be. Another thing Judge Boyce did allow in his courtroom in Boise, Idaho, during the Lori Vallow Daybell trial was that he did allow a televised verdict. Uh, and, and I've wondered about that too, if that would perhaps change his mind as to how that could work too. And again, Lori Vallow sentencing was televised and live streamed. And that was interesting. I actually, I, I flew to Rexburg for Lori Vallow Daybell's sentencing. And then I ended up not going. I was live with Nancy Grace um, during the sentencing, watching it from my hotel room, because then I realized the way the courtroom was set up in Fremont, nobody could even see Lori Vallow Daybell. Uh, they were all sitting behind her. Like not even the victims or anyone could see Lori Vallow Daybell. Like they, they were all, it wasn't set up like the Boise courtroom where you could see the jurors and Lori and the counsel. Uh, everyone was to the back of Lori. And I realized I would have a better view watching it live and, and, uh, it was a great shot. And again, it was a respectful shot. It was the court cameras and they just showed again, the whole courtroom like they're doing today. And that's transparency to me. That's transparency. So, uh, you know, because judge Boyce has also had experience with the verdict and with the sentencing, both being live streamed, maybe he's changed his mind. Maybe he's changed his tune. Maybe he's realized that, Perhaps cameras aren't so bad. I don't know. Maybe I will be surprised and hear him change cameras for this trial. I know that Kay and Larry Woodcock and, and many of the surviving victims um, do want cameras. And that could also sway Judge Boyce's decision. I know that they really asked and hoped for cameras Tammy Daybell's mother was sick. She's now passed away. 
And they asked for cameras at Lori Ballow Daybell's trial because they could not travel and she had cancer that was terminal. And even then, Judge Boyce did not allow cameras. So I really don't know what's in his mind. You know, it, it's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. It could it could go both ways. It could go both ways. But my prediction is he's going to stick to his camera ban. But I could be wrong. I, I really could. I I you know, I really could be wrong. What does everybody else think, by the way? All right, we're back on the record on CR 22211623. The court took under advisement briefly its ruling on the issue of a reconsideration of video and photographic coverage of this case, including the trial. Uh, a couple of notes the court will have in making this decision. Uh, the court has listened to arguments of the state requesting that we keep the case status quo. Uh, and I'll note we did conduct a trial in the Lori Vallow case, which was initially joined with this case, later severed and tried in Boise during the process of those proceedings in order to allow some additional access. Uh, the court did permit a broadcasting uh, on a limited basis of that trial to two separate locations where the public could view outside of the courtroom. One was a location in Ada County in their courthouse and then a second location in Rexburg, Idaho. Um, and there were certain reasons for doing that, mainly the fact that venue was changed and the case was taken so far from this location uh, where the home counties are. Uh, so that factors into the court's decision. This is now a trial of Mr. Daybell. Uh, one of the big concerns I had also for the initial trial was potentially tainting jurors for what I knew would be a second trial coming up if the entire proceedings were broadcast from the Lori Vallow trial, uh, concluding that anyone who had watched that trial or portions of it would likely be unable to serve as a qualified juror in this case. Um, the court has also heard the request from the defense and the rationale for allowing broadcasting of the proceedings, including trial, and the courts considered the briefing and arguments submitted by Ms. Olson for her various media clients who are requesting the ability to uh, conduct broadcasting and photography of the trial during the proceedings. Um, a few things I'll note. First of all, under Idaho Court Administrative Rule 45B, the court has the discretion to make this determination. That rule reads that the presiding judge may, at his or her discretion, limit, restrict, or prohibit audio, video, audio or visual coverage of any proceeding and those decisions are not subject to appellate review. Uh, I am compelled by some of the arguments that a difficulty in moving a trial about 350 miles away from where we currently are certainly restricts access by certain individuals that wish to attend. Uh, the argument by Mr. Pryor that the defendants, uh, family members that would like to see the proceedings is a compelling argument. I know from the last case also, there are uh, other individuals, family members of victims, family members of defendants and others very interested in the case or connected to it, which uh, were unable to attend because of the location. I'll note also that the court still has under advisement and we'll hear argument later this morning about changing venue. But as I sit here to make this decision, we're currently scheduled for trial to occur again in Ada County in this case. Uh, in balancing out the requests here, the court is determined or has uh, de made a determination that uh, in order to provide adequate access, the court is going to permit that the trial uh, be broadcast while it occurs with certain restrictions. First, the court is going to be in charge of all equipment and the broadcasting of that. I'm not going to allow that to be conducted by any third parties. The 
court has the equipment to do so. We did that in the previous trial when it was broadcast to those other locations. It worked well uh, in all the reporting I got back from those that attended and those that ran the system. Uh, and with the equipment to do that and the court's own website, which provides an ability to stream it live from the state of Idaho judiciary website, public is given free and unfettered access to view the proceedings that way. So uh, with that in mind, the court won't allow any still photography given that the matter will be broadcast um, on video through the court's own system. And in addressing some of the other concerns as it relates to any microphones placed by any media or third party, of course, those will not be allowed because the court's going to use its own equipment to broadcast the proceedings. And in addition, there were concerns about the exclusionary rule. So witnesses who would be testifying, uh, not being allowed to view the proceedings before they testify. I'll note that was already a concern in the first trial with Ms. Fallow. And we had an affidavit that addressed that and required each witness to certify under oath that they had not viewed the proceedings and did in fact run across a few witnesses who were not able to do that and took those matters up outside the jury. I think that system worked well to make sure that there was not any improper influence on testifying witnesses. So the court will employ that same method of allowing witnesses to testify only after they've been able to certify under oath that they haven't been tainted by viewing previous testimony. Uh, there will be some additional technical uh, terms of how the court will allow the broadcasting and those will be followed up on in a subsequent written order that I'll enter into the case for trial. Uh, going forward with other pretrial hearings, the court will take those up on a case by case basis, uh, but this will be the ruling for the trial and how publicity will be handled. So um, I have balanced out also the concern of certain witnesses who uh, don't wish to be captured on recording forever. And I understand that and I've had to balance that out. I'd note at the last proceeding, they were also uh, photographed whether they wanted to be or not as they went in and out of the courthouse because it's a public area and the media was pretty persistent in trying to capture images and pictures of them. So there's really not any way to completely prohibit that. And while that's unfortunate for those that do not enjoy being on camera or all the publicity, um, that's just part of the stress, I guess, of being involved in a case like this and having to testify. So the court uh, is going to amend its current order as it relates to the case. And as I mentioned, I'll follow up with some additional detail in a written order, but I wanted the parties to be aware of where uh, this would be heading as we get closer to trial. So that will be the court's ruling on the motion at this time. Uh, Mr. Wood, does the state have any questions on that ruling? Not at this time, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pryor, any questions? No, Your Honor. Okay, and Ms. Olson, any comment or question? All right, thank you. That will conclude the first motion then. Uh, the next motion we will bring up, if the parties are ready to proceed, will be the state's motion to amend the indictment. This is a motion that the state filed on November 13th of 2023, and a response and objection was filed by Mr. Pryor on behalf of his client on November 17th, 2023, and the court's prepared now to hear argument on that. Um, who will be arguing on behalf of the state? I will be arguing this one, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Blake, are you ready to proceed with argument? I am, Your Honor. All right, you may go ahead. Thank you. Idaho Criminal Rule 7E and Idaho Code 19-1420 are the governing authorities regarding amending indictments. Both of them make clear um, Idaho Code essentially reflects very similar language to the Idaho Criminal Rule 7E. It adds some additional uh, language regarding prior to the plea being made by a defendant that an indictment or information may be amended. Since we're post the plea of not guilty, um, we're not focusing on that part of the section. But essentially both Idaho Criminal Rule and the Idaho Code allow that prior to the prosecution resting the case, 
an indictment or information may be amended so long as no additional charges are added and the defendant is not prejudiced by the change. We, are, uh, we filed this motion approximately six months before what will be the start of the defendant's trial. So our position would be that the defendant is on adequate notice as to the request to modify the indictment. I would also indicate that for the benefit of counsel and the court, I did submit a proposed amended indictment with the changes italicized for the benefit of court and counsel to be able to observe those. That was submitted just by email, waiting to determine whether or not the amendments would be approved prior to submitting a new filing. There were three main amendments that the state is asking to modify. I will indicate they reflect the same modifications that were requested and granted in the co-defendant's trial. The first one is to modify the subsections referenced in counts one and counts three. Those are the counts dealing with conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft. They are specifically dealing with the code sections referencing the grand theft. It would be a request to change it from 18-24034A to 18-24032A. The state's position on that is it actually is more reflective of the language contained within the current indictment, not specific to the defendant, but there was a charge of grand theft. That charge reflected the language regarding that the theft occurred by deception. When we look at the case law in Idaho, looking first to State v. Ghana, 117 Idaho 83, and that's an Idaho Court of Appeals case from 1989, it specifically outlines the purpose of the information is to allow defendant notice and opportunity to prepare a defense. And in State v. Bolas, 93 Idaho 749, that's a Supreme Court case from 1970, there was a, an amendment made changing the code section from one that described the differences between first and second degree burglary to the code section that defined the crime of burglary itself. And the court found that there was no issue with making that modification. The defendant wasn't prejudiced. The court found the defendant was always on notice that the underlying charge was burglary. In addition, when we look to State v. Dunn, that's 60 Idaho 568, again, a Supreme Court case from 1939, the court found there was no substantial difference to the charge of, uh, to whether or not the charge of obtaining money by false pretenses was that the defendant received or executed the contract. The court found the defendant was charged essentially with having fabricated the contract, regardless of the method in which that fabrication occurred. And again, they found that there was no substantial change. The defendant was properly on notice. There was no prejudice to the defendant. And then in State v. Severson, 147 Idaho 694, that's again an Idaho Supreme Court case, but from 2009, the court laid out the relevant factors to determining whether the defendant was prejudiced is whether it took the defendant by surprise, impaired defendant's ability to adequately prepare a defense, subjected the defendant to double jeopardy, or required extensive further preparation by the defendant uh, in preparing for trial. In Severson specifically, the court found the amendment merely alleged an alternative way defendant may have committed the crime. None of the defendant's substantial rights were prejudiced. Essentially in that case, the state added a theory that the victim in that case had died from suffocation. And the court found that that did not modify the charge itself. It didn't add a new charge and the defendant was properly on notice with no prejudice. In this case, the state would say we're in a similar position. The requested amendment does not add a new charge. It simply modifies the subsection under which defendant is accused of having committed the crime. The defendant's properly on notice. In addition, the indictment con contains language reflective of that subsection 2A. If anything, the state increases the burden by having to prove uh, the crime was committed through some use of deceit versus simply that a theft itself occurred, um, that it was simply knowingly, we add that element of deceit. So if anything, it would increase our burden. In addition to that, the state would indicate the actual charge isn't the grand theft itself, especially with regard to the defendant here today. The actual charge is conspiracy. It's just one of the elements is the 
it incorporates the elements of the grand theft as part of that conspiracy. So we think that that is an appropriate amendment. We think we're doing it in plenty of time to give the defendant advance notice of that modification. In addition to the fact one could argue the defendant was on notice during the course of the co-defendant's trial when the state made these modifications, knowing he was charged under that same indictment. So I think the defendant is on adequate notice, there is no prejudice, and there is no additional charge with that change. The next requested change would be for, do I reference the correct counts? On that last point, Ms. Blake, I'm not sure you could deem it notice where in the first case that um, the amendment occurred right, right before the state rested at the end of the case, and then um, knowing that this issue was in the indictment here uh it's it's up to the state to make that amendment and change it so i guess they could speculate that you were going to do that and to, until such time as we're here i don't think they're really on notice that that's happening until we argue it as we're doing today and i can appreciate that point i guess the fact that it was amended would have at least given some indication that there could be the potential. I would agree the actual notice was not until the filing of the document. There had been some discussions amongst the state and defense counsel that we would be filing a motion to amend the indictment, but I would agree until the actual filing, it isn't considered official notice. But I think they were aware of that occurrence um, during the co-defendant's trial. Looking at counts one, three, and five, the state is requesting to add the language and or between the co-defendants listed in that or the co-conspirators and or potential co-conspirators. The state's position similarly, we look under that same test and the state's position is this clearly does not add a new charge and we would also argue it does not prejudice the defendant. In addition to that argument in State v. Yang, 167 Idaho 944, it's an Idaho Court of Appeals case from 2020. While it was a touch different because this was a case in which they were asking to modify a jury instruction to be given regarding the co-conspirators in the case versus amending an information or an indictment, the court found that adding the language and or was not a substantial change to the jury instruction. What the court essentially found is it is not incumbent on the state or necessary to prove the number of co-conspirators or the identity of each co-conspirator. It's simply that there was an agreement with at least one other person and one of those parties committed an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. So knowing that those aren't um, officially elements of the case, I think looking at State v. Yang, that provides clarification and the guidance that this would be an appropriate modification in addition to that, we are asking for this well in advance of trial um, to put the defendant on notice that we would be asking for that modification. I don't think that changes anything with regard to the elements of the crime or the burden required. And I think um, that has clearly been litigated in the courts here. The last one that the state had noted in the motion itself to amend the indictment was a change to count five and specifically overt act number 10. The state is asking to change um, the month to months with um, adding the S. Essentially, it was a typographical error um, requesting that it be changed to the months before. And looking again at um, some of the cases we've cited to before, Ghana, um, the defendant had argued that he was not on proper notice because the state added a charge of persistent violator three weeks before trial. The court found that was sufficient notice in amending that three weeks before trial to add that. And then again, looking at the test outlined in Severson, the state's position is this does not add a new charge and it does not create any prejudice to the defendant. It is not a double jeopardy issue. It's not um, going to create any kind of extensive preparation by the defense or further preparation by the defense. In addition, the state would argue similarly that this modification was made during the co-defendant's trial. The defendant has been in possession of the discovery in relation to this case. The defendant has had the benefit of watching the co-defendant's trial and are observing and listening to it, where it is clear that this was uh, what was presented during the trial, was that it included the months. 
In the amended indictment sent to the court and counsel, there were a few other italicized um, proposed changes. Those were not specifically addressed in the motion. They're simply uh, typographical errors or errors where certain language was left out. I could go through those, but essentially the state's position would be similar to what we just argued with the months. They're not adding new charges. There's no prejudice to the defendant. We're bringing them in advance of trial requesting permission. The state does recognize that it is in the discretion of the court once a plea has been entered by the defendant, whether or not a state is allowed to amend an indictment or information. However, both the rule and code make clear that before the prosecution has rests, that it is appropriate to bring the motion. So with that, the state would request that the court grant this motion to amend the indictment reflective of the changes sent to the court and counsel. All right, one question, Ms. Blake, on some of the proposed amendments here. Uh, if you have it in front of you, the proposed amended indictment. Yes. Page six, there's a uh, common scheme or plan in Fremont is how it reads now, and it says Fremont and Madison counties. Yes. Uh, do you want to address whether or not that uh, would be permitted pursuant to the rule, or does that require any... Uh, further findings by the grand jury? I don't believe it requires any further findings by the grand jury for the reason that I it was a uh, simply a typographical error and left out. When you read the count and the contents of it, it includes in the county of Fremont, state of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Madison County, Idaho, and as part of a continuing criminal transaction and common scheme or plan in Fremont counties. So, and Madison was simply left out of there in the same body of that count itself, it includes Madison County already. So it was simply to correct the confusion that may be from Fremont and then having counties um, and Madison was simply left out. But the, the rest of the indictment and the information presented included uh, acts in both Fremont and Madison County. And that's what has always been purported and alleged by the state. So I would argue similarly, it doesn't modify anything. It doesn't prejudice, or excuse me, it doesn't modify it as far as a new charge, and it doesn't prejudice the defendant. I don't think it creates any kind of a venue or jurisdiction issue either, especially given what's in the body of the rest of the indictment. It would simply be to alleviate any confusion that may be seen um, there by having simply Fremont and then the plurality. All right, thanks for the response on that. All right, the state submitted its argument in support of the motion. Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to present your argument in opposition, you may. Judge, there's no doubt that the prosecuting attorney has a right to amend the indictment right up uh, uh, before the close of their case. And, and again, I was aware of, of some of these. I'm not going to argue the month or months. I think that's uh, given the what they've uh, represented, that's appropriate. In addition, in terms of the overt acts that they talk about, including the language of Madison County, I guess. Could you just pull the mic a little closer there? <clears throat> We're not picking up the recording. That was not good. Alternative, you can, and you can argue standing or from council table either way. Judge, in addition, I guess I could make an argument. Is that acceptable? The level of noise, sound. It's still a little quiet, the clerk says. That any better? Yes. I'll try to lean forward and talk that. I judge, I've never been accused of not having a loud voice. So this is a, this is new for me. And the court's smiling, court's aware of that as well. Uh, thank you. Judge, in regards to the Madison County, uh, quite frankly, the state is right. And, and at least in this perspective, they're right. Uh, they alleged in the uh, the actual body of the language that Madison County was above that and about two lines above the change they're alleging, they actually mentioned Madison County. So for me to suggest that they, they can't do that would I think be improper. So I, I, I'll agree to them allowing that. There is an argument, I guess, in terms of bringing it back to the grand jury to make a, uh, a, a representation about the venue, but I, I'm not gonna engage in that today. However, what I am judge can engage in is the language on counts one, three, and five. This is my concern. I understand the previous case uh, uh, Ms. Blake represented, uh, talked about that the and and or was not uh, uh, 
dramatic change in terms of what's represented. But the concern I have with this judge is if you look at the actual indictment and look at the language, they're alleging that Lori Vallow and or Chad Daybell and or Alex Cox and or the other conspirators that were involved in this case. Now, uh, to date, and there we've dealt with this before, we have no idea who the names of these other conspirators are, or at least the state hasn't disclosed the other conspirators that were involved in this case. But the concern is that it shifts the burden and it changes the burden that the state's gonna to have to prove. And how it does that is this, is that a jury who's, who are not legally educated citizens are going to look at the indictment and say, well, under this particular allegation, we don't actually even need to prove Mr. Daybell did anything wrong. What we have to prove is that, well, it could have been, could have been Lori Vallow or Alex Cox or the other conspirators. Don't even need to prove Chad Daybell to find him guilty. All we have to do is that the others were involved in this. That's all that, and, and that, that kind of logical thinking can go, go towards what, what the jury would be thinking about this. And unfortunately, if that's what they want to do, then they need to take this back to the grand jury and have them approve this language and say, we're going to indict Mr. Daybell because and or can be defined as meaning whether he, well, he could have done it, yeah, and he could have been there, or it could have been the others. But if it's just the others and not Mr. Daybell, we're still going to find him guilty because the amendments that the state is, is alleging in terms of uh, count one, count three, and count five, that sort of thinking can take place. And that is my concern. And it's confusing. And I know Mr. Archibald touched on this at the time, and the court allowed these, these changes to go forward. But my concern, again, is this, Judge, is that the plain reading of that language, by including and or between the the unnamed co-conspirators that we don't know who the, well, I don't know who the names are, Alex Cox, Lori Vallow, and Chad Daybell, the state put and or on all of the names, change that, and that in essence changes how the plain reading of that particular uh, phrase could be interpreted. That is my concern. And it's enough of a concern, Judge, that Technically, you could look at this and say, Mr. Daybell could be found guilty of one, three, and five without having done anything, given that the others, uh, well, or the others could have been involved and they could impute that onto Mr. Daybell. That's my concern. Uh, lastly, uh, I understand that they're alleging grand theft under 2403. My concern is that they alleged it in front of the grand jury under one particular uh, section of 2403. They are now changing that to a different section under 2403. The case law is not clear at this point as to whether or not changing the underlying charge or any of the subsections, it doesn't address that. It does say that if you change the underlying charge, uh, that, that could be problematic doesn't address whether changing the subsection and the, the level of proof that they're going to do. And I would concede to the state that it's not six months, Ms. Blake, it's four months before we start the trial, less than four months at this point. But uh, I would concede, Judge, that if, uh, if the court finds that just changing the subsection is not enough of a change, uh, you know, obviously I would accept the court's decision, but it is a different subsection under the grand theft charge, and it does require a different burden of proof. And the state saying that it made it more difficult on them, I don't agree with that. What they've done is they've changed the subsection on what they're trying to get Mr. Daybell convicted of under, under uh, the, the, the crime of grand theft to a different subsection. That is a change, uh, no matter how you put it. Whether or not it's permissible, I'll leave that to the court's decision. All right, thank you for the argument, Mr. Pryor. Ms. Blake, do you have any rebuttal argument? Uh, just briefly, Your Honor, as the state indicated um, with regard to the grand theft, the actual charge is conspiracy. And so I would indicate that again, as well as the cases previously cited, which do allow for, which have in the past allowed for amendments that change the theory of how a case or under which elements or theory presented under subsections the crime was committed doing. In addition to that, I think State v. Yang makes very clear that it, regarding a conspiracy, the state is not required to prove the number of co-conspirators and they're not required to prove the identity of the co-conspirators. Again, a conspiracy 
the state's burden would be to prove that there was a plan engaged in a common scheme or plan and that at least one of the actors engaged in that plan committed an overt act. There is no requirement that every person engaged in a conspiracy commit an overt act. So I think to indicate that somehow others' actions may be imputed to Mr. Daybell, that probably is not a wrong assessment by the defense, but that's the nature of a conspiracy is any one of the co-conspirators committing a bad act does in fact is one of the elements of a conspiracy. So I don't think in any way modifying the and or adds any additional burden on the defendant and in no way is it burden shifting. The state's requirements under conspiracy remain the same. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. All right, I'm uh, prepared to make a ruling at this time on the motion. This is the state's motion to amend the indictment in this case. The court will note under Idaho Code 191420 that there reads amendment of indictment um, may be amended by the prosecuting attorney without leave of the court before a plea. We're after a plea here, so at any time thereafter in the discretion of the court, where it can be done without prejudice to the substantial rights of the defendant. So that's the standard the court looks at contained in that statute. There are some clerical amendments being requested and there are some substantive amendments being requested in the state's new proposed indictment. The courts looked at uh, the case law on this issue. The there's a case, State versus Jeske, 164 Idaho 862, and it's a 2019 case that says the decision to permit an amendment is a matter within the discretion of the trial court. And then that case also cites to a case, State versus Severson, 147 Idaho 694. The court may allow an amendment of an information, and in this case, an indictment would apply at any time before the prosecution rests, so long as doing so does not prejudice the defendant's substantial rights or charge the defendant with a different offense and then citing to criminal rule seven and section 191420 that I just mentioned. So there's a uh, discretion here for the court to consider it. Starting with the clerical corrections requested and included among those, the addition of the word Madison County on page six, the court finds that the state's motion is permitted pursuant to Idaho code 1914-20 on what I'll consider the proposed amendments that are clerical in nature. So the motion's granted on that going to the more substantive requests of the state, primarily on counts one, three, and five, where there's a request to amend the stated statute under which grand theft by deception is contained in the indictment. Initially, it was listed as to C, I believe, which is, or was it D? What, what was the initial, uh, I know it's being changed to 2A if you have it amended, but what was the subsite that was in the initial indictment? I could pull it up. We have it as 4A, Your Honor, that it was initially under 4A. 4A, um, thank you for the direction there. The theft statute is kind of a large statute, but the request is that under 4A, which would be by possession of stolen property, it's for, to be amended to 2A, which was theft by deception. Uh, the court will note, I did previously look at a similar request to amend in the prior case, and that's relevant here. And I'm talking about the Lori Vallow case, the 1624 case, uh, because the indictment is the same between the cases and the parties here. So I noted then when I considered that at trial and allowed the amendment that the language of the indictment has read by deception 
and it would comport with the offense under the 2403A under 2A to be theft by deception. I don't find that that constitutes a new charge or a different charge. Uh, the either grand jurors or trial jurors uh, are not pulling out the code to read the code sites to see if that's what the offense is. They simply follow the instructions of the court that are provided that list out the elements of a crime. And the question here is whether or not Mr. Daybell was adequately put on notice of the theory of the state's offense as it relates to the theft part of this conspiracy charge. And because it was listed as theft by deception all along in the caption, and because also the language uh, within those counts one, three, and five described theft by deception, the court does find that allowing the amendment to 2A more accurately describes the statute upon which the defendant's been charged and does not constitute a new charge, nor does that result in a prejudice to the substantial rights. Uh, I'll allow the amendment then on those provisions, also noting that at this point, we are still in advance of trial, not real far in advance of trial, but enough in advance of trial that the defendant is adequately advised of what the charges are. I don't find that any of the proposed amendments either would require resubmission to the grand jury for a determination that probable cause was found on these offenses and that this can be amended by motion, which the state has done today. Uh, finally, I would also agree with the state's position here that on the and or provisions that the underlying offense as actually charged here is the conspiracy offense. And under conspiracy law, uh, the state's burden here is to show a common scheme or plan as alleged and an overt act. And the case law, including the Yang case cited by Ms. Blake, permits the state to have alternatively listed co-conspirators uh, following conspiracy law. And because it's charged as conspiracy on those counts, I also find that does not result in any new charge or a prejudice to the substantial rights of the defendant. So I find the motion to be timely at this point. The court will grant the motion to amend the indictment and the proposed amended indictment as received by the court will be allowed to be filed in the case. And that will be the indictment that will instruct the jurors at trial. That'll be the court's ruling on the motion then. Ms. Blake, do you have any questions on that? No, Your Honor. Mr. Pryor, any questions? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thanks, counsel. The next motion before the court is the state's renewed motion to reconsider the change of venue. Uh, this motion was filed by the state on November 15th, 2023. The defendant filed their response and objection to the motion on November 17th, and this relates to the court's pending decision or current decision that the trial will be conducted in Ada County. Who's going to be arguing that motion today? I will be, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Blake, are you ready to proceed with argument on that? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, why don't we do this? Uh, let's have a quick about five minute break in case there are any one here that wishes to either use the restroom or leave before we proceed with the rest of the motions. So we'll take a quick recess and then come back on and start with the change of venue motion. All right. Wow, wow, wow. Two cameras in the courtroom. Wow. I, I don't even like that. That changes everything. And I just want all of you to know that we are going to be right here like this, watching it together, Chad's entire trial. Uh, I think Judge Boyce covered what he he doesn't like. I know that Judge Boyce does not like. Uh, I'll bring myself up for a little bit so you can uh, see me a little bit more. There we go. I know that Judge Boyce does not like uh, the way that news cameras oftentimes are in the courtroom. He finds them disrespectful if they zoom in right on the defendant and then zoom in on the defendant the entire time. Um, 
so it sounds like they're going to be doing courtroom cameras. And I will say, uh, for those that were listening to our audio, you guys did not see the courtroom cameras in Boise, but there were indeed cameras. I wanted to share that too. Uh, people said, well, they didn't have a camera set up, so this will be new. We don't know what it's going to be like. No, there was an entire overflow area in the Ada County Courthouse in Boise where they had three angles of cameras and they showed all three angles on the screen. And I'm going to be honest, um, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. Uh, the thing that actually made it a little bit difficult is they had all three views that were very wide shots, wide shots, meaning, um, in broadcasting, there's a, you know, well, in video editing, there's wide shots, there's close ups, there's medium shots. They were all wides, very, very wide. And then they had it on a giant projector that was like this big at the courthouse in the overflow room. But then they put all, I think the issue was they put all three of the, the angles on one screen. So think of the zoom we have now, and then they had three of those. So they were all smaller, right? You know how I make myself smaller. So like, here's two. Well, right now we have two, right? We have the court is currently on break and then we have me. So picture three of those all the same size fit onto one screen and they're all wide shots. They're all these far away shots. So you can see the entire court room. So you could see the, uh, not the jurors, of course, but the witnesses, the judge in, in the defendant, the prosecution and the defense. I think though, that if it doesn't work, I think they're going to figure out something that does work because they are going to broadcast it. And I think that with the public viewing it, they will get a lot more feedback about what is working and isn't working. I know at the beginning in, in the overflow room, so every, every reporter was in the overflow room the first week. They did not allow any of us in the courtroom because it was jury selection and they did not want any of us to see any of the jurors or know their identity. So for the first week during jur jury selection, every reporter was in the overflow. And the first week uh, there was, uh, Lori was silhouetted because there was a window right behind her and they hadn't shut the blinds. And so there was this backlight and we couldn't see anything. We gave the court that feedback. They changed it. They put the blinds up. So I don't know how they're going to do this, but for those that are wondering if they've had experience in Ada County, uh, covering Lori's trial with cameras, they have, they, they had that in the overflow. So, you know, uh, we'll see, we'll see how they do it, but we will be here. So, but what I want to say is I, we will be here. We will be watching it together. So, I, I mean, if it doesn't change, it could change, right? Everything changes. His trial date could change. The location could change. Um, you know, they, they could continue arguing until the, the end of the world, which was a couple years ago, according to Chad, a few years ago. I can't remember now. We're all still here. Hey, Chad, how you doing? But we'll be here as of right now, if this is the plan, watching it together. I am so excited. And, and uh, for those that say, oh, I'm going to miss your lunch lives. I look forward to your lunch lives. This is a lunch live. Look, we're at a recess bathroom break. I could never do lives during a bathroom break. And here I am going live with you guys. And I keep saying I'm actually going to go and grab some water and I need to go do that. I am just so excited about cameras in the courtroom. I can't believe it. I also want to point out to something big about no cameras. Koberger's case, Brian Koberger at the University of Idaho killings, Moscow, Idaho. Let me tell you how important this is. They have been arguing no cameras in the courtroom for Brian Koberger, right? They have, they have cited Lori Vallow Daybell's trial as an example of that. And they're both in the same state. They're both in the gem state, Idaho. And so they're able to say, Hey, well, look what judge Boyce did that worked. Lori Vallow Daybell's trial. We don't need cameras in the courtroom. We don't need no sneaking cameras. This is actually going to make that harder to argue. And I think that this is going to set a very healthy precedent for additional cases in the state of Idaho. Brian Koberger, I don't know how they're going to be able to easily argue that anymore, that they have cameras at Chad's trial. So uh, it's interesting. All of your all of your thoughts and speculation on this is is so interesting. I've loved watching the tr the chats. Will tr Will Lori testify at Chad's trial? Will she be able to watch Chad's trial? Will um, <laughs> so many questions. Will Chad's children be watching the trial? What will they think of the evidence? Are are his children still uh, supporting him, or is is the dam breaking for some of them? A lot of empathy for his children too, and I really appreciate that that they were raised in this. Um, 
you know, and they want to believe that their, their own mother could never have been murdered by their father. So I'm going to go grab that water. I see you, Jill. Lauren, go grab that water. I'm going to do it. I'll be right back. I'm going to put this on mute. I still have this in my ears. So even if I ever go away, guys, I'm hearing everything. So I'll know if it starts back up. Don't freak out if I'm not here sitting when it starts back up. I'm grabbing water. I'm also going to check in with Dr. John, with Dr. Babe. Um, we had a family tragedy this week, so I'm going to go see how he's doing and let him know what's going on here and that I'm going to be uh, here for this, making myself cozy, and he's going to have to take uh, some future phone calls we have scheduled today. Be right back. We are back on the record. KCR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. We are scheduled next to hear a motion on the state's renewed motion to reconsider change of venue. Motion filed November 15th with an objection filed November 17th. Uh, I can't recall who was arguing this, Ms. Blake. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Blake, if you'd like to present argument in support of the motion, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. And the first thing the state wanted to address was, I think, uh, in the defense's response, there had been an indication that motions to reconsider are inappropriate or not allowed. So I just wanted to go ahead and address that first. Um, they are allowed uh, under State v. Montague, 114 Idaho 319. That's an Idaho Court of Appeals case from 1988. The court makes clear that it is in the discretion of the court whether or not motions or requests for reconsideration are considered. Um, essentially, the court pointed out that because such a request is not specifically mentioned in the rules of criminal procedure, a trial court um, is not without power to act upon it, but it, essentially it would be within the trial court's discretion. And they also looked at the federal rules of criminal procedure, which similarly do not contain any such motion, a rule regarding a motion or request for reconsideration, and specifically found the federal courts have held that a trial court is free to entertain such a motion when made. And then essentially the Idaho court joined in that finding. In addition, State v. Wolf, it's 2013 Idaho, Ida, excuse me, APP Lexus 86, and that's an Idaho Court of Appeals case from 2013. In that case, there was a motion to reconsider a Rule 35. And similarly, the court looked to State v. Montague for guidance and found that a motion to reconsider can be allowed. And then they went through an analysis as to whether or not it was proper with a Rule 35. Ultimately, they found that it was proper that it could be considered by a court, a motion to reconsider a Rule 35. In that case, it came down to a timing issue. I think a couple years had actually passed um, on some appellate issues that that court was looking at, but the actual motion to reconsider was found to be appropriate. So I do think it's clearly established in the Idaho rules that a court is allowed and can consider a motion to reconsider. The courts go on to talk about, uh, I believe it was State v. Montague, it may have been Wolf, I apologize, I should have had notes about that. But essentially, they talked about that there were some additional facts and considerations for the that were brought forward for the court to consider. I think it was in Montague, and it was regarding um, some evidence that was not presented at a motion to suppress by the state, but that the state had in its possession. So they had asked for a motion to reconsider and present that evidence. The, the appellate court found absolutely the court could consider that. They did kind of admonish and say maybe the state should have brought that the first go round, but where it was new information not previously presented to the court, they found it was absolutely appropriate for that court to reconsider. The reason I bring that up is I think we find ourselves in a similar situation. However, this information was not within the state's possession at the time the original motion for change of venue was brought forward, but we do have a new we are in a new situation with the passage of time, as well as new media coverage and heightened media coverage in Ada County. So like a, before we go into the merits of the motion, then I'll, I'll make a comment on that on the reconsideration, because I think there's some inconsistency in the Idaho case law, because I'm aware of other cases. I know of one in particular that, um, and I don't have the site off the top of my head, but I've used it on many occasion with attorneys in criminal cases that says, uh, unlike the civil rules and the Idaho criminal rules, there is no motion to reconsider. That being said, I do think that within the court's discretion at times, there are certain types of motions that merit reconsideration. 
um, motions that develop additional evidence, motions in limine, et cetera. This particular motion, as it relates to a request to reconsider the change of venue, I would find appropriate. So despite pot potentially conflicting case law on that, I think it's procedurally proper to bring the motion. And so uh, I'm just saying, don't be concerned about a ruling based on you can't reconsider this because I think in this case it can and should be reconsidered. So uh, with that in mind, if you'd like to go into the merits of the argument, you can. Thank you, Your Honor. And I appreciate that clarification from the court that there is case law disputing that. I um, had found the cases that specifically allowed for it. Um, so looking at uh, the merits of the motion itself, where the state believes that we are at is there are a couple different rules that govern requesting for change of venue. The state does not believe that we are in a position of actually requesting a change of venue. That was done by the defendant and Idaho code 19 1801 specifically says the defendant can request a change of venue if they feel that there would be bias or prejudice or an issue with holding it in the actual venue where the crime is alleged to have occurred. In this case, there's no question that Fremont County is the originating venue and the appropriate venue. The defense brought a motion back in, well, it was ruled on in October of 2021. It was filed before that. So it was ruled on quite some time ago. I know the state had done a motion essentially kind of a hybrid motion to reconsider and also to consider bringing in a jury. So reconsidering some of the findings made with that order. However, um, now there has been a significant longer passage of time. In addition to the fact, of course, the biggest change was the defendant essentially demanded a severance, requested the severance and was granted that severance. After that severance was granted, the co-defendant Lori Vallow opted to proceed with her trial in Ada County. And the reason I say opted to proceed is, as the court probably recalls, it was actually the defendant that brought the original motion to change venue and was granted the change of venue to Ada County. However, at that time, the cases were still joined for trial. And when Ms. Vallow was found competent and her case also started moving forward, the indication from her and her counsel were they were fine with the change of venue. They, they were in favor of it, essentially and they never requested anything different. So we proceeded with her trial that started the end of March of this year and proceeded into mid-May. So, and as the defense points out, some of the timing and reference in some of these motions is off given uh, the hearing date versus when they were filed and when the initial drafting was started as well. But we are now less than a year from when that all occurred. During that trial, there was daily coverage. I know that's been covered in part in the motion to allow cameras back in the courtroom that was argued today by the parties. A lot of that was already referenced. There were daily reports coming out. There were interviews being conducted on the courthouse steps daily throughout the trial. Those interviews included comments on evidence that was presented, uh, opinions on the credibility of witnesses, opinions on the culpability of the defendant and the co-defendant. Uh, I know there were some references made regarding Chad Daybell during that time as well. So with that, we just think based on the argument made by the defendant that he thought the coverage was too pervasive here in the 7th Judicial District and specifically Fremont County, we now find ourselves in essentially that same position, but in reverse. The coverage in Ada County has been very pervasive. The state does recognize that when we look at the numbers, the coverage in the 7th Judicial District as a whole and Ada County area as a whole is very similar. Ada County numbers tend to come in a little bit higher, but we recognize the coverage is still um, broad in both areas. However, at the original change of venue, there were no specific findings made with regard to Fremont County. Fremont County was clustered into the 7th Judicial District, and in part, that dealt with um, a witness for the defense that ultimately any testimony regarding Fremont County ended up being excluded because enough people weren't polled to make accurate or sufficient findings regarding the pervasiveness in Fremont County. Some of the other things looked to were the vigils and things that had gone on in relation to this case here in Fremont County. At the time the order had come out, it would have been approximately 14 months since the most intensive media coverage, which really um, circled around the finding of the children's remains. Since the finding of their remains, 
I believe at the time the motion was filed, it had been about 28 months. And so we have a significantly um, larger passage of time from when that media coverage was so intensive and from when the vigils and things were being held here in Fremont County. But we are now only about six months away from when that was going on in Ada County. There were crowds gathered at the Ada County Courthouse steps to hear the reading of the verdict. In addition to that, in Ada County, we had approximately 1,800 jurors that were summoned in. We had approximately 700 that were subjected to board ire and which included some of the information um, regarding the underlying facts of the co-defendant's case, which are also similar to the underlying facts of the defendant's case here today. So we have a significant pool of jurors that have now been exposed to that. In addition to that, those jurors are not told not to talk about the proceedings, whereas in Fremont County, a grand jury was seated quickly and the grand jury proceedings are secret. So any jurors that sat here in Fremont County on this issue have been still ordered not to speak about that, whereas the jurors in Ada County are now free to discuss that. In addition, when we talk about individuals like there's one there's one thing i do want to bring up here that occurred in fremont county that i think was probably the pinnacle of media exposure of the whole case lori vallow sentenced here july 31st of this year in this courtroom and i haven't looked at any objective data but i would guess that was probably the single most covered event of either of these cases and that occurred here in Fremont County pretty recently. So, And I think what we had found on that is Ada County was covering that just as heavily as this area would have been. So I do recognize that occurred here in Fremont County, but it was a well, daily coverage. Uh, but the event here, I guess you could say, was maybe more than that, because I know people were literally camped out here the day before they were all around the courthouse um, for 24 hours before that, and the courtroom was packed to capacity. And I, I see that, if, if I'm following the logic of your argument, of being pretty problematic as it relates to potential jurors here in Fremont County. And I can understand the court's concern with that. I guess the state's position would be when we're looking at the media coverage and what has been broadcast, the quality and the quantity, we are... What we found is that it was very similar in Ada County. So even though the sentencing occurred here, the media coverage was just as pervasive in Ada County regarding that event occurring here. Um, I do recognize we had a packed courthouse. I recognize there were a few um, individuals that camped out on the courthouse lawn. I would also indicate during the trial in Ada County, the courtroom most days was packed to capacity. There were some days that it wasn't, but it also we had an overflow room to allow for individuals to watch the trial. And I do think that that was attended at times. Through certain portions of the trial, I think that was pretty packed as well. I didn't go down to look, but I know the courtroom was a capacity um, for some of the events with that trial, including, I think at a minimum, the closing statements and also the verdict um, being read there in Ada County. But I do recognize the court's concern with that. I guess um, the state's position would be that the coverage did not continue, even if it was pervasive, even if that was a highly covered event, it did not continue for months after that. Uh, Ada County's interest seems to have been piqued even more so by the trial being held there. We had individuals in public roles in Ada County that gave interviews. The only reason I bring that up is I think oftentimes if it's someone you know, someone that may be a public figure in the area you're from, you may be more likely to hone in on that. Those interviews were conducted there at the courthouse in Ada County. So displaying the courthouse, I think there was note of some vigils being held here at the Fremont County Courthouse years ago. And so, again, just um, looking at that, that raised some additional concerns and some additional facts that the state thought should be considered at this point in time. Um, And I think, again, just really focusing on the defendant's initial arguments and his motion to change venue, essentially it was a motion to change it out of the seventh judicial district because there was really nothing presented specific to Fremont County. So the state's position is Fremont County does have a smaller population than Ada County and we absolutely recognize that. But we do believe given that we were able to see the grand jury, given the passage of time from some of the main events occurring here, and I will give the court with the exception of the sentencing, the other main events that have occurred here, occurred here, there's been a longer passage of time from when we had this massive trial. 
The court had also focused on the media coverage regarding the co-defendant in the initial order granting the change of venue. That coverage only intensified during the trial there in Ada County. Again, the state does recognize that coverage was here in the seventh judicial district as well. Um, but again, nothing specific with Fremont County has been presented or located regarding that. We do believe that a fair and impartial jury could be chosen here in Fremont County. I know this, this matter has been brought up in a motion to reconsider, but of course also factoring in the cost to the county. Um, Judge, I'm gonna object at this point. They didn't bring up the cost specifically in their motion. And quite frankly, I've been quite patient. The fact of the matter is their argument was based literally to the media coverage. And if they're gonna be allowed to expand on this, then I want a continuance and I'm going to go back to every little item and we'll have to go through this again. So at this point, I'm objecting to this, this financial argument because they did not make any mention of that. I thought there was a mention. There, okay. there was a brief mention, but I'll, I'll just keep it brief. That, that is all I was gonna say really regarding that is what was contained in the motion is obviously some of the factors the court can factor in and consider when determining whether or not a change of venue is appropriate are the costs and things. I think the court addressed that in the prior motion. The state, um, Fremont and Madison County are cognizant of that issue as well. And so we just um, bring that to the court's attention also. As an alternative in our uh, motion, we had indicated, again, looking at the population of Fremont County and considering that that may be a concern for the court and a factor, because of the pervasive coverage in Ada County, because the defendant um, opted to request a severance and the co-defendant opted to proceed in Ada County, I think we are now in a different situation. So we would ask the court to reconsider whether or not Ada County is the appropriate change, uh, the appropriate venue, if the change of venue is still determined to be appropriate, given that. Um, Ms. Blake, do you have a, I don't know for sure the number, do you know currently what is the population of Fremont County? I mean, I'm I should know. I, up. I think it's around 14,000 people. That sounds about accurate. I don't know when the last census was done. I should have that information, but that sounds accurate, which I do think is a large enough number to pull in 1,800 potential jurors if we were to follow what we did in Ada County. All right. And I would need to confirm. I, I had heard at <clears throat> one point from a jury commissioner here that I thought there were around 2,000 qualified jurors total out of Fremont County. And at our last trial, we pulled 1800 for starters. Um, and that was not a capital case. And we may have to look at uh, additional issues that come up with juror disqualifications with a capital case. Um, just looking at the numbers there though, but if we're looking at around that 2000 qualified jurors, and I just note that something uh, I did look into and have to consider, despite the media coverage in Ada County, I mean, it's a whole nother world in terms of population there. They have approximately between 275 and 300,000 qualified jurors out of Ada County. So um, it's, you know, 100, 100 times, I guess, the amount of potential jury pool there. Um, and I, I'm just making some commentary here and I'm not deciding the motion at this point, just making some commentary, but I am fully cognizant of the of the burden and cost and expense and concerned about that as well. So I do appreciate you raising that. Uh, the court has to take those issues seriously when determining the appropriate venue for the trial in this case. So uh, apologies for my interruptions, but if you have any further argument, you can present that. That's um, no, no apologies necessary. I would just indicate while 1800 jurors were polled in Ada County, because I know there's a concern we may need to poll more, but only about 700 of those actually were um, subjected to the board dire. So I think when we look at numbers, we may not need to go over a mark that Fremont County can um, easily meet. Uh, it's my understanding Fremont County does have a high percentage of juror turnout as well when they are summoned in higher than some of the surrounding counties. But again, then that's why we bring up the alternative of possibly considering another venue such as Twin Falls, Bonneville County, Bannock County, jurisdictions that have a higher population that would be able to easy, maybe easier, it would be easier for them to meet the juror numbers than Fremont County, but would not have been subjected to such pervasive media coverage as Ada County. All right, well, I appreciate the argument and comments, Ms. Blake. Thank you. Let me hear a response now on the state's motion to reconsider the change of venue issue, Mr. Pryor. 
Judge, I agree with the court's assessment. My review of the case law was that, uh, at least limited review of the case law in this regard, was that the court, uh, there's no um, rule or law statute that allows for a motion to reconsider. The court can obviously do that. And in the present day uh, case, the court sui sponte decided to revisit the camera issue. And I appreciate the court's ruling on that uh, issue. And uh, just as a clarification, it was Mr. Daybell's family in Utah and outside of Fremont County that was unable to participate. And given the case ruling, they'll be able to at least watch and, and we're thankful for that. This is my concern, Judge, about what they're, they're trying to do here. They're trying to revisit a situation that took a significant amount of time to put together a presentation uh, talking about all of the concerns about having a case in Fremont County. And if the court took the time to revisit its order, there were a number of factors that the court took into consideration. And the court took the time and the and a length of time to, to an, analyze and evaluate what would be the best situation. And one of the concerns, Judge, was the inflammatory nature of what was transpiring in, the, uh, in Fremont County at the time. And you talked about it in your order that there was a lot of inflammatory uh, um, information that was being disseminated out there, and this was of a concern. Uh, I had an opportunity to go home and visit my family over the holidays. And um, I went by a site um, that 40 years earlier as a young man in high school was the scene of a, of a horrific situation regarding one of my very close classmates, uh, the death of that classmate. And that in no way diminishes or minimizes what happened in this case, and that's not the intent here. But judge the emotions of seeing that 40 years later brought back the same very harsh feelings, the very same strong feelings, the, the, the anger and the resentment, and that event took place 44 years ago, and all it took was me driving by that site, and it brought it all back. And it was a horrific situation. We're talking 14 months. We have a situation where the prosecuting attorney's office at the courthouse in Madison County and Fremont County had all sorts of signs on the courthouse grounds. We had all sorts of publications. The prosecutor can't convince me that the feelings and the, the, the anger and the emotion has diminished. And in fact, in many ways, it's getting stirred up again. How's it getting stirred up? The court took some of my, uh, uh, some of my uh, um, information I was going to uh, present and that Lori Vallow was sentenced. Judge, I heard they were camping outside. They were staying overnight to watch that. My understanding is, and I didn't show up because I wasn't gonna be part of the same media circus that she was talking about. But the courthouse was full. And where in this courthouse are they going to cover the overflow crowd that they had during the Lori Vallow trial? Where is that gonna take place here? And I think it's highly inappropriate for them to forum shop and say, well, we're not gonna have it in Fremont County, but let's pick some of the other counties like uh, Bannock, or let's pick one of the other counties in Idaho Falls, or let's even do Madison County. And unfortunately, the court in its order talked about the religious underpinnings that are part of this case. If we're really going to effectively consider moving this case, and that's really even something that's feasible, 120, less than 120 days before this trial is supposed to start? 120 days? Now, Judge, I've done preparation and I've made plans. And if I'm going to have to change those plans, if we're going to do this, Judge, let's move it. If they're, if they're so concerned about pervasive media coverage, let's all go up to Coeur d'Alene. Let's all go up to Grangeville and let's do that because there's just as much population. In fact, uh, other than Boise, the population up in the Coeur d'Alene, Post Falls area, that's a large population. And we don't know what's going on up there. We could move it up there. And let's all, all of us travel up there for the next 10 weeks and do that. And let's see how that works out. The reality is that the, the trial of Lori Vallow worked. There was room. They handled all of the situation properly. There were the facilities to handle this. And judge for the last at least two or three months, 
the construction that's going on in this courthouse, and I just heard it again three or four times, when is that going to end? When are they going to be done with the construction out here? Are we going to be listening to that during the trial? Because they can tell me and answer that and say, oh yeah, Judge, we've been told that it's going to be done uh, in the next two months. But nobody can promise when we're going to stop hearing the drills and the falling and everything else that's been going on during this hearing. But back to the substantial argument, Judge, uh, if you look at the numbers, the court pointed out, and I checked on this, there's a little over 300,000 qualified jurors in Ada County with a population of uh, 700, with in all of Ada County, seven, 750,000 people. So 300,000 qualified jurors. We need less than 1% of the jurors from Ada County to bring in a jury. And if we even took 1%, that would be 3,000 jurors. We have to go back to what the reason for change of venue is. It's to pry to find jurors that either haven't heard about this case or haven't formed an opinion, that haven't uh, made a decision regarding this case. And to some extent, you were effective in doing that during the Lori Vallow trial, to some extent. But we only take 1% of the jury pool from Ada County. On the other hand, we're going to take over 10%, over 10% of the, the, the jury pool from Fremont County. I think it's highly inappropriate for the court to even consider anything other than Ada in Fremont County. Quite frankly, I think it's inappropriate even for the court to consider this. I, I object to this motion and I object to the fact that a defense attorney is the one and the defense is the one who's supposed to file a change of venue. And in essence, what this prosecutor is trying to do is what this prosecutor is trying to do is rechange the venue and they're doing a change of venue that's not even permissible under the rules. They can do a motion to reconsider. What they can't do is do their own change of venue, which is in essence what they're trying to do here. But back to Fremont County, we have all the inflammatory uh, uh, stuff that the talk, court talked about in its order, the pervasive amount of information that was being disseminated. And today, what we have is we have Mr. Eaton here today. And Mr. Eaton was here today and he hired legal counsel and said, hey, I run East Idaho News, not Idaho News, not Western Idaho News, not Northern Idaho News, I run Eastern Idaho News. And his readership and his group of folks that he represents in East Idaho News, that he disseminates all this information on the eastern part of this state, are highly interested in hearing this case. They are so interested in hearing this case that he hired an attorney, a very well-known attorney, to come up and say, we want to broadcast this so that all of my folks who partake in, in reading and viewing the stuff that I disseminate out there in East Idaho can have a chance to do that because we don't have the facilities here to accommodate all the people in East Idaho in this courtroom to watch the trial. So we need to have cameras. And that wasn't from me, that was from their lawyer. 14,000 folks in Fremont County. 2,000 voters that are capable of, um, of being voters. If we need more than 2,000, Judge, we have to pull them all in. We have to, in essence, pull every single juror that's capable of being able to participate in a trial over here. Now, the prosecutor brought up the grand jury, and I'm not going to, to violate the court's order in regards to discussing the, the situation regarding the grand jury. But there were issues that I addressed in my previous motions regarding the grand jury and judge, I'm not going to, to get into specifics, but the court knows what I'm talking about and the council knows what I'm talking about in the ability to obtain a grand jury and pick a grand jury. I want to point out further that this is that almost every law enforcement officer in this case, with the exception of the FBI and Bode, Lab Bode Laboratory, all of the officers who are investigating it, who are at any part of this, Fremont and Madison County, all of those witnesses, the vast majority of my witnesses. Now, I don't know how many witnesses the state's going to have. Uh, at this point, I 
I don't want to be held to a number. Judge, there's a significant number of witnesses. And the vast majority of those witnesses are all from Fremont and Madison County. A large number of those folks that we're going to be calling. And those large number of witnesses that we're going to be calling have family, have friends, live in the community. And this is going to create a nightmare. We are not going to be able to obtain people who don't know witnesses in this case. We are going to be cutting out vast numbers of witnesses. And just from a number standpoint, this is going to be a huge problem. I'd ask the court to revisit its order again regarding the inflammatory nature. I understand and the court noted that in its, in its order, you said that you can get a fair trial in Fremont County. And I truly believe that. I truly believe that in any standard case, the average criminal case, the folks in this community would provide a fair and just verdict in any other case. But as the court pointed out in its order, this is not an ordinary case. This is a high profile case, and it doesn't matter that the media attention occurred in Ada County. The media attention has saturated the entire state, the entire country, and my sister, who is gonna hate me for mentioning this, who lives in Europe, knows all about this as well. It's gonna be very difficult to find jurors that aren't related to people in Fremont County. We're gonna have a very difficult find finding people who have not been exposed to this of those 2000. And it's gonna be far easier if we have to pick from a pool of 300,000 as opposed to 2000. And judge, for all of those reasons, I'd ask the court for you to deny their motion to reconsider. All right, thank you, Mr. Pryor. Ms. Blake, any rebuttal argument? Uh, just briefly, Your Honor, I think there, there was a lot of talk about uh, the amenities and the different things with the courtroom facilities. The state's position is that is not appropriate to consider as a reason to change venue. I don't think that's ever um, contemplated in case law or in the rules regarding change of venue. Additionally, it was mentioned that the state cannot bring a change of venue. Idaho Criminal Rule 21A clearly indicates either party can. However, the Idaho Code references specifically the defendant. However, the state does not see this as bringing a new motion for a change of venue because Fremont County was the appropriate venue. And the state's position is it remains the appropriate venue. We hold all the other hearings here. Just simply trial was moved to Ada County and we have just asked the court to reconsider the granting of that given the new information. They um, specifically mention East Idaho News that they are here. What the state has found is East Idaho News actually has an international following. People from around the world as well as the nation, including the whole state of Idaho, follow East Idaho News. It is not a news outlet that is specific to East Idaho. In fact, there's nothing to show that there are more followers, followers here in Eastern Idaho um, with that coverage. In addition, East Idaho News was over in Ada County, was conducting interviews over there. So I don't think in any way, uh, if anything, in the state's opinion, that kind of becomes a wash um, given that information. And I think, um, so as the state's indicated, looking at the prior concerns raised by the defense, we think those prior concerns now exist just in relation to Ada County. It sounds like the defense is of the position that it should remain in Ada County, even though those concerns exist and there has been that pervasive media coverage. Um, but based on that new information, we felt it appropriate to ask the court to reconsider and to present this information to the court for the court's review. So we would ask the court to factor uh, all the new information in, in determining whether or not um, moving the venue back to Fremont County or essentially reconsidering and changing the court's position on the change of venue or whether or not a change of venue to another county should be considered if the court determines that a change of venue is still appropriate given all the new information. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Uh, Council, the court is going to take this issue under advisement and issue a written ruling on the motion. Uh, I know the timeliness is of the essence here with the trial coming right up and the parties need to know for planning purposes. So we shouldn't have too long of a delay in getting a opinion out that will address the state's motion. We've got three additional motions. Uh, Council, I guess I would like to inquire at this point, 
if you want to forge ahead or if you want to take a lunch break, uh, I don't want anybody to feel rushed because we're not breaking for lunch and we certainly can do that. And if you think it's going to be another um, hour or so of argument, I would suggest we probably do lunch. But Mr. Pryor, your motions, what are your thoughts here? Judge, there'll be a brief, arg well, brief, relatively brief argument on the first one. Uh, on the last two motions, Judge, those are procedural um, for purpose of appealing potential appealable issues. So there'll be almost no argument on, or little to no argument on the last two. So I anticipate uh, five to 10 minutes on the first one. Uh, I don't know how long Ms. Blake's gonna talk. I'm not gonna hold her to anything, but it's gonna be relatively brief. Okay, so you'd prefer to just keep going? Yes, Your Honor. Wanna keep going? We're fine with continuing, Your Honor. With okay. We'll next take up then a uh, motion in limine that was filed by the defense. It's a motion in limine uh, to state. I'll just give me a motion to look. Motions filed November 9th by Mr. Pryor on behalf of the defendant entitled motion in limine to limit state to consistent arguments on defendant's relative culpability. And that was filed, as I mentioned on that date, there's been a response filed and an objection by the state filed November 22nd. So Mr. Pryor, I've reviewed the motion and the state's objection. If you'd like to present oral argument, you may. And judge, I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, I'm gonna go back just a little bit of the, the history. Part of the history, Judge, is at one point during the proceedings, I believe it was the pretrial, the court had discussed what the issues regarding discovery. It was found that there was still some outstanding discovery that had not been provided by the, the state to the defense. And I'm talking in regards to Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. At that time, Mr. Daybell had waived his right to a speedy trial. Ms. Vallow had not. Uh, as part of a sanction, the court sanctioned the prosecuting attorney for not turning over the discovery and withdrew the death penalty as a result of, of that case. Uh, in this particular case, because Mr. Daybell had waived his right to a speedy trial, we could proceed in the cases. Now, granted, it was my request to sever, and that was my request to do that. But at this point, Mr. Daybell needed additional time, and we proceeded with a separate trial. That sort of ties in actually with the venue as well, but at this point, that's been settled. But in regards to this case, during the trial of this case, the closing arguments were made. And Judge, I submitted the case law that applies, and I appreciate the state pointing out state versus Pierce, which they did in their response. And it basically confirms what I'm saying, Judge. These folks are co-defendants. That's what's very important. They are co-defendants in a case. They are co called co-conspirators. And up until the, the, the state did not turn over the discovery, and basically the cases were separated, and that was really the, the, the main reason why they were separated, um, uh, they were going to have a trial at the same time. Now, it would have been impractical for the state to argue in front of the jury if both of the cases were together and say the things that Mr. Wood said. Chad is not going to act without Lori saying so. Chad seeks confirmation from Lori. Chad is not going to do anything without Lori it's all chat. It's all Lori, 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 Lori. Now the state provided some factual issues as it relates, and this is all reference, Judge, in the the transcript of the trial. It is all noted in my my response in terms of the the trial transcript as to where it was was noted and what Mr. Wood said. This is the concern, Judge. If these trials had been together, Mr. Wood would not have been able to say, "Chad is not going to do anything without Lori." If the trials were combined. Mr. Wood would not have been able to say, this was all on Lori and she was the one driving the ship. She was the one directing the, 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 this so-called conspiracy. She was the one in charge. And then turn around when it was time to talk about Chad and say the same thing. That would have been terribly inconsistent and the jury would have said, which, which one is the truth? Which is the truth? Which is the truth, Mr. Wood? Was it Lori driving the force of the ship? Or was it Mr. Daybell driving the force of the ship? Which one of these was the one running the show here? And what he said in front of, and it was very clear, there's no confusion here. Mr. Wood specifically said, this was Lori, 
and she was the, run, the one in charge of the conspiracy. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. He was very clear. Now, the case law, particularly the federal case law, and Pierce alludes to the fact that a prosecutor cannot, in one instance, sit there and tell one set of jurors six, eight, well, a year ago, or whatever, eight months ago, say one thing to one set of jurors and stand up in front of them and say, Lori Vallow was the run one running the whole show. Tell that set of jurors that, and then turn around in Chad Daybell's trial that's gonna occur starting hopefully in Ada County in four months, and tell them, oh, well, I know I told the jurors in Lori Vallow's trial that Lori was in charge and she was doing, and she was the one driving force behind everything, and she was in charge. But you folks here at this new jury in Ada County in April and May, I'm going to tell you something different. I'm going to tell you now I've decided that now Chad is the one who was doing all of this. And it was all Chad, Chad, Chad leading the conspiracy. It was all Chad who was the leading force and he was dictating everything. They're not allowed to do that and the federal case law supports that. So the prosecutor responded in terms of culpability, but quite frankly, Judge, it's, it's making it's making the legal argument. You can't make one legal argument in terms of who is the culpable person leading the conspiracy, in charge of the conspiracy, and make representations in a court of law to one juror's pool and a, and a juror's in a trial, and then turn around in a brand new trial of, of a co-defendant and make different representations. So what my motion in limine is saying is that Mr. Wood can allege any of the facts he wants against Chad Daybell. What Mr. Wood cannot do under the case law, at least the federal case law and under Pierce, is Mr. Wood cannot make the representation that Chad Daybell was the one behind and leading the conspiracy was in charge of everything. He is not allowed in closing argument or otherwise to say, hey, you know what? I told the jury in Ada County one thing, I'm not allowed, I'm, I'm going to tell you that, well, I know I told the jury in Ada County that, but I'm going to tell the jury in Ada County in Chad's case that, well, actually it's Chad who was in charge. You're not, a make, not allowed to make that inconsistent representation. They can make any factual representation they want, and I'm not going to stop them from presenting any facts that they want to present as long as they're relevant. But what they can't do is make inconsistent or contradicting arguments to a jury saying one person was the leader of the conspiracy in one co-defendant's trial and make a different representation in Ada County. And what this motion is, is, is saying is we cannot allow Ms. Blake or Mr. Wood to tell the jury in Chad's case that Chad was in charge of the whole thing and that he was running the show. Now, in addition to Judge, and I'll cover these, the other ones now. The culpability argument is this, and it's just a fundamental fairness and due process argument. And it applies in this one as well. If you're going to say to a jury in Ada County that Lori Vallow was the one in charge and he made those representations, it's completely, you know, he can't, he can't change that. It's a public record. He said to that jury that Lori Vallow was the one in charge of this conspiracy. And um, it's, a, it's a culpability argument. And the fact is, is that Lori Vallow, who had her death penalty pulled as a result of the prosecutor not providing discovery and was sanctioned, now what they're doing is they're seeking the death penalty against Chad Daybell because he waived his right to a speedy trial and he was not the leader of this. According to Mr. Wood's own words, Prior, the death penalty was on the table way long before the cases were severed. So they're not seeking it against him because he waived speedy trial. And that's not what the point, Judge. The point is that the if we're really going to take Mr. Wood for his words, and we're going to accept that I would assume Mr. Wood was telling the truth to a jury, because if he isn't, he was uh, he's got some other problems. And if he makes inconsistent arguments to a jury in Canyon or in Ada County in Mr. Daybell's case, he's got other problems. But that's not the point. The point is simply this, is that when you're talking and making a representation to a jury in Ada County in Lori Vallow's case, and you say to those jurors that Lori Vallow was the one who was in charge of the whole conspiracy, 
and that Chad would do nothing unless Lori told him to do it. And Lori and Alex were following, or Chad and Alex were following Lori's lead. He doesn't get to say the same thing in, in the other trial. And on top of that, we're seeking the death penalty against someone who is a, allegedly is a lesser co-conspirator and wasn't even the leader of the conspiracy. So that's where the death penalty arguments judge, and I will leave it at that. All right. And to be clear then, Mr. Pryor, did you incorporate your other two motions within that argument as well, or did you want to? I did, those? Judge. Okay. I did, Judge. And for the moment, and for the interest of saving some time, that's where the arbitrary and capricious and the other arguments come in, is that if you're seeking the death penalty against someone who is, uh, at least according to Mr. Wood's words, were not the leader of a conspiracy, uh, my, argu my argument is simply this, is that you're seeking to put someone to death when in fact Lori Vallow, according to their theory of the case, was the leader of this entire scheme. All right, thank you, Mr. Pryor. So the court's now heard the argument as it relates also to the uh, motion to strike the death penalty as arbitrary and capricious, and also the November 9th motion to strike the death penalty on relative culpability. Those were incorporated into that argument. So, uh, Mr. Wood, are you going to be presenting argument as it relates to each of those three motions? Uh, Your Honor, the, I was planning on arguing the motion in limine, and Ms. Blake was planning on arguing the others. Okay. Um, uh, th and that's fine. You can divide those up. I'm fine with that. Lori Vallow was the one running the whole show. Never said that. She was the one in charge of the whole conspiracy. Never said that. Chad would do nothing without Lori telling him to. Never said that. Not the leader of a conspiracy. Never said that. So the defendant's contention is that the state argued at Lori's trial that Lori was more guilty or in charge, and therefore the state cannot argue that Chad is equally guilty at his trial. And that by claiming Chad is equally guilty, we would be changing the core theory of our case. This is the state's contention. We are not changing the core theory of our case. The state's core theory will be the exact same core theory as argued at Lori's trial, that Chad and Lori Daybell, along with Alex Cox, by acting together by way of conspiracy, planned, aided, and abetted together, and encouraged the, and caused the deaths of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell. Those same individuals conspired to fraudulently steal social security funds, and that Chad Daybell committed insurance fraud when he claimed the life insurance benefits for his murdered wife. It's the same theory. So I'm gonna divide this up. Uh, the defendant's motion is not based in law. It's not based in fact either, but it's not based in law. I'll talk about the law first. The defendant's argument ignores the basic law of conspiracy. Conspiracy requires an agreement and one overt act by one of the parties to the agreement. Once that is established, all conspirators are equally guilty. There's no relative guilt in a conspiracy. Guilt stems from the agreement that a crime should occur. This whole who's in charge, who's a leader, that has nothing to do with the guilt. The defendant has failed to argue how he should be free from the law of conspiracy. He's ignored that basic premise of that law and instead is attempting to convince the court to adopt a legal framework that simply doesn't exist. State's position that this court is actually precluded from granting this motion uh, by a decision it made at Lori Daybell's trial. Her trial after the state arrested, the defendant in that case filed a motion a Rule 29 motion for acquittal. And this defendant's whole argument is based on Lori's case. So we're gonna go back to that. They filed a motion to acquit and this court found that the state had presented sufficient evidence that Chad Daybell had committed overt acts to allow a jury to decide. Now, Chad wasn't on trial and I wanna be clear, this court wasn't saying Chad did those things. It wasn't saying the jury should find that Chad did those things. But it did say, this court did find, there was sufficient evidence of his overt acts to go in front of the jury. And in a conspiracy, one overt act by one conspirator does get held against the other. That's the law. And the court found multiple occasions 
Uh, looking at that, the, tr the same transcript, the same day of the closing argument, page 3796, text messages dealing with light and dark ratings. Between, that was between Chad and Lori. Uh, text messages entered into evidence between the defendant and Chad Daybell, meaning between Lori and Chad Daybell about Tamara Daybell being dark. And Chad Daybell said, I feel she will be gone soon. About an application to increase life insurance to the maximum amount allowed. Cell phone data and messages admitted, sufficient evidence to, uh, to send to the jury, overt acts uh, dealing with the conspiracy. And so it would be incredible, a polar opposite ruling and entirely inconsistent for the court to now say, uh, yeah, you presented sufficient evidence to go to a jury before, but now you don't get to make the same arguments. Uh, further in the law, the defendant's argument ignores Idaho Code 194030, which states that the distinction between an accessory before the fact and a principle and between principles in the first and second degree in cases of felony is abrogated. All persons concerned. Sorry, Mr. Wood, what's, what's the citation on that? 1940, 30, 1940, 30. Thank you. Uh, all persons concerned in the commission of a felony, whether they directly commit the act constituting, constituting the offense or aid and abet in its commission, though not present, shall hereafter be prosecuted, tried, and punished as principles. And it goes on a little more. Uh, so in Idaho law, there's no distinction when you're dealing with co-conspirators or aiders and abettors between the trigger puller and the aider and abettor or the co-conspirator. They're all equally guilty. At Lori's trial, the state presented ample evidence of Chad Daybell's involvement in Tylee, JJ, and Tammy's murders. What was some of that evidence? Now, I know that... Uh, the defendant's just talking about closing argument, but he's opened this door to talk about the trial. It all comes in. So what was some of the evidence? Text messages clearly talking about the impending deaths of the victims. Text messages and other evidence of a, an affair that provided a motive for the murders. Evidence regarding financial gain that was another motive. Where did we find Tylee and JJ's remains? In Chad Daybell's backyard. And who told us where to find them? The evidence was that Chad Daybell told law enforcement where to find them in his infamous text to Tammy about killing a raccoon and burning limbs. That's not saying Lori's in charge. The defendant's argument about the state's closing, about the state's closing argument is factually invalid. The transcript of the state's closing argument, the initial closing argument is 42 pages. The rebuttal is 10, so 52 total pages approximately. And the defendant ignored and or omitted 99% of what was actually said. They picked out a few phrases, none of which are the full statement or sentence. None of which are the full statement or sentence. And there's one in particular that I think really showcases this and highlights the lack of validity to this argument. Uh, in the, the defendant's brief, he speaks about a quote about Lori being the conduit of information to Alex. And when you actually look at that, the citation that's given there, he literally omits the first part of that sentence, not just a whole statement, the sentence that talks about the relationship between Chad, Lori, and Alex. So never mind that we're talking about Chad. We're just going to take this little snippet and try to twist it into something that it doesn't say. And so what else did he leave out? They ignored the state's language, any of the state's language that placed blame on Chad Daybell. They left out the many times that the state referred to Chad and Lori as they in regards to planning, in regards to the conspiracy. They left out when the time when the state said that Chad and Lori are driving this together. This is all in my brief. They left out when the state references Chad's text to Lori about JJ, Tammy, and Tylee dying. They left out when the state referenced Chad and Lori Daybell's plan and their future together. They left out the phrase referencing Chad, Lori, and Alex, which was used at least twice, acting together, they caused the death. 
We said that in regards to Tammy. We said that in regards to Tylee in the closing argument. Acting together, they caused the death. We didn't say Lori it was in charge and made Alex and Chad do this. Now, to be clear, we, do, we did talk about Lori manipulating Chad. We talked about Chad manipulating Lori. That doesn't make one of them more guilty or less guilty. They left out the evidence presented by the state of Mr. Daybell's so-called patriarchal blessing to Alex Cox, which was strong evidence of religious manipulation of Alex on this defendant's behalf. They left out the evidence presented at trial that Alex believed Chad said what everything Chad said, and he'd do whatever Chad told him to do. In their brief, they make a common thread argument that at one point when we re refer to uh, Lori as the common thread, being a common thread doesn't make you more guilty or less guilty. In fact, the fact that this individual, that this defendant married within weeks after his wife's death what the evidence showed, the evidence showed had an affair with, the fact that she's a common thread is highly inculpatory for this defendant. It doesn't make him less guilty. Um, the issue, the argument of seeking confirmation is evidence of an agreement, it's evidence of a conspiracy, and it's evidence of encouraging the murders of Tylee, JJ, and Tammy. But if the defendant's free to argue what he wants. He's not free to say that we said things we didn't say, and he's not free to take snippets of what we said and ignore the rest of it. If he wants to go into what happened at Lori's trial, he has to take all of it, all the evidence, all the closing argument, the full 52 pages, and not just a handful of snippets. The state was clear in its closing argument and in its presentation of evidence. This was a conspiracy. There are three counts of conspiracy. There's no relative culpability in conspiracy. We never said that, and we're not going to in his trial. In conclusion, the defendant's argument has no basis in law. It has no basis in fact. The defendant ignored the vast majority of the state's argument to pick out a few snippets. The defendant ignored the vast amount of evidence presented at trial. The defendant, this defendant asked for a severance and he got it. So of course, of course at Lori's trial, we focused on her because she was the defendant on trial. We will focus on Chad at his trial. We will present the same core theory. And the case law in the state's brief, uh, while we will pre uh, present that same core theory, we're allowed to do it in different ways. We're not tied to uh, the exact same presentation of evidence. We're not tied to that. Uh, the case law is clear. Uh, so one, again, as a matter of law, or as a matter of fact, I, this rep, misrepresent, it's a misrepresentation. It's, it's a misrepresentation of what we said. As a matter of law, even if this court believed the factual representation, the law does not provide for this remedy. Um, it, conspiracy and the law of principle and aiding and abetting does not distinguish between who is more culpable or not. As such, we respectfully request this court deny the motion. All right, um, Mr. Pryor, we're gonna hear additional argument from Ms. Blake on the other two motions, but for now, I'd like to hear any rebuttal as it relates on the motion and limiting argument just provided by the prosecutor. Judge, it, it sounds like what Mr. Uh, uh, Wood is arguing is the relative culpability, and I, maybe I'm not being clear. Uh, I cited the uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, um, I think it's Stump, that talks about um, inconsistent theories. And I appreciate Mr. Wood going through all the factual allegations of this case and all of the things that he's going to try to prove against Chad in this case to show that there was a conspiracy. And my argument, Judge, Although I believe in this case that Chad was not part of a conspiracy, the argument here, Judge, isn't that uh, I'm objecting to him trying to prove that there was some kind of conspiracy. What I'm trying to show is that Mr. Wood made specific representations, and he can say all he wants that I've misrepresented things, but it's really clear. It's in black and white, and it's in recording. 
And there are 52 pages of what Mr. Woods said in his closing argument. And the whole world out there can see what he said. And what he did say, Chad is not going to act without Lori saying so. It's in the transcript. It's a public record. And he said it. And he made a number of other representations that are in my brief. Now, he can do this snippet thing all he wants and say, oh, you took it out of context. The out of context argument occurs when you don't want to take responsibility for what you said in front of another juror, jury pool. And what he said in front of that jury was clearly that Lori Vallow was the one driving this conspiracy, if they're, if, you know, the conspiracy in this case. And rather than take argument from me or take argument from Mr. Wood, Judge, read the closing argument. I've pointed out what Mr. Wood calls the snippets, but the words are the same. And it's very clear that Mr. Wood made it very clear to that jury in Ada County that Lori Vallow was the driving force behind this whole alleged conspiracy. And this argument that there's no case law or anything to support this. Well, I cited the Supreme Court case, Judge. And the United States Supreme Court said he is not allowed to offer inconsistent theories. And it's an inconsistent theory for him to stand up in front of one jury pool and say to that jury, Lori was the driving force behind all this. Lori was the one in charge. Lori was doing this, 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 and this and then turn around and say the exact opposite. Now, he can argue all the facts, and he did a very fine job of relaying to the public now all of the, the information that they intend to try to prove in this case. And I'm not going to take the bait and engage and show you all of the information I have. But what I will say is that the United States Supreme Court and also the, the case law in Idaho under the Pierce case cited by Ms. Blake talks about the fact that you're not allowed to offer inconsistent theories. And I would su suggest to the court that an inconsistent theory is as simple as telling one jury pool or a number of jurors in Lori Vallow's trial that Lori was the one in charge and she was running the show. And if he turns around and goes in front of the Chad Daybell trial and says, oh no, what I told Lori Vallow's jury pool isn't what I'm going to tell you folks. Chad was actually the one in charge. That is an inconsistent theory. Now, all of the facts that he brought up about raccoons and all of the other stuff, he's free to do all that he wants. He can do everything he wants. Have at it. What he's not allowed to do, though, is suggest to a jury pool in Ada County in Chad Daybell's trial that Chad Daybell was in charge of this conspiracy. He can, if he's able to prove there's a conspiracy, have at it. He can do all of that. But what he can't do is stand up in front of that jury and tell them that Chad Daybell in any way was the one who was the driving force. And that's exactly what he said to the Vallow folks. He told them that Lori was in charge. Lori was in charge. And he can make all the representations. Oh, it's being misinterpreted. It's not being said. It's in black and white. I cited the site, I cited the, the transcript pages, I, I put the quotes that he said, the words he used, and it's in those documents. So I leave it to the court. You look at it, Judge, and you tell me whether he represented to a, in a court of law that Lori was in charge. And then if the court decides that Mr. Day, Mr. Wood is allowed to change his theory and tell a different jury that, uh, no, I, I told them one thing, but I'm gonna tell Chad Daybell's trial a different thing, so be it. All right, uh, this is as it relates then to the motion in limine, which was filed on November 9th. We will hear in a moment state's response on the final two motions of the day, but I've considered the argument on this motion and I'm prepared to make a ruling at this point. I'll first note that uh, some authority here on the standard I look at a motion in limine is a request for a protective order to limit or exclude evidence at trial and applies only prospectively. The purpose of this type of motion is to avoid injection into trial matters which are irrelevant, inadmissible, and prejudicial. In that case is State versus Walmuller, 125 Idaho 196, Court of Appeals case from 1994. And then a 
Civil case cites the same standard that applies here. A decision to grant or deny a motion in limine is left to the broad discretion of the trial court. And that's Gunter versus Murphy's Lounge, 141 Idaho 16. And that similarly, the trial court has afforded broad discretion in admitting uh, evidence and will not be disturbed on appeal absent a clear abuse of the discretion, Chapman versus Chapman, 147 Idaho 756. So the motion for the court right now is a motion requesting that the court limit the state to certain arguments that are argued to be consistent arguments on the defendant's relative culpability. The state has countered that the citations provided in support of this motion are taken out of context. Uh, the court having looked at the context and some of the citations in the state's brief does agree that there were matters taken out of context in support of the motion. The underlying theory here of the state is a conspiracy, uh, conspiracy charge between the conspirators, Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow, and Alex Cox and others. That's been from the outset through the indictment in the case, uh, the state's theory, the court presided through the trial of Lori Vallow and heard the state's theory at trial as well. Uh, the state correctly points to Idaho Code 19.14.30 about abolishing the distinction between accessories and principles, which gives the state broad latitude in arguing their theory of the case as it relates to a conspiracy charge. And the question before the court right now is, is there something in the record which would require me under a motion in limine to prohibit certain conduct or argument from the state? And I don't find that there is anything brought in the motion that would prohibit uh, the state uh, in its theory of the case at this point. I will note clearly, I do agree with the general premise that the state cannot come in and argue a set of facts A at trial number one, and then turn around and argue distinct separate other different facts B at trial number two in the interest of trying to convict two individuals there certainly would need to be some consistency in a theory of the case if the evidence is the same. Um, however, I don't see any evidence that the state is engaged in that or is going to. If in fact at trial, there is some contradictory argument made that directly contradicts evidence or argument made, the court would reconsider that ruling as it comes up at trial. That may be also subject to the impeachment of the defense to raise at trial since the transcript of that first trial is all available. But for purposes of making a preliminary ruling on the evidence through this motion in limine, I don't find there's any grounds to grant the motion. So for that reason, I am denying the motion. Uh, we'll submit an order to that effect. Mr. Pryor, do you have any questions on that ruling? Judge, I just wanna be clear that uh, in, given the fact that it was Mr. Wood that made the representations to the jury, what I'm reading the court's order is that if if I find that, at least from my perspective, that Mr. Wood is making contrary, inconsistent uh, representations, that uh, that transcript, including the closing arguments, would then be available to the uh, Mr. Daybell's jury for review. Is that what the court's saying? Well, what I'm saying is you would have the ability to raise a motion at trial, and we would likely take that up outside the presence of the jury to, uh, if you believed there was a clear contradiction uh, and and we could head that off before the jury heard it, but I'm not making any ruling on that at this point, and I don't believe the state has has done that. Um, I don't think they will do that, but um, I think they understand how that would work, trying the second case with the same facts with a separate defendant. So we'll submit an order that for these reasons, based on the bench here today, the uh, motion is denied. Mr. Wood, do you have any questions about that ruling? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. What we'll conclude with then for now is, Ms. Blake, if you'd like to respond to the remaining two motions, which were incorporated into Mr. Pryor's previous argument on the motion to strike the death penalty um, due to the court striking the death penalty in Lori Vallow's case, and also the motion to strike the death penalty on relative culpability, I'll hear your arguments on those and then any rebuttal from Mr. Pryor. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I'll try to be brief with these as well. 
When we're looking at the potential imposition of the death penalty, there is a significant amount of case law regarding that. And turning to Kennedy v. Louisiana, 554 U.S. 407, a 2008 Supreme Court case, they reiterate that the Eighth Amendment um, provides that a person is supposed to be free from cruel and unusual punishments that may or may not be excessive. That court went on to note capital punishment must be limited to those offenders who commit a narrow category of the most serious crimes and whose extreme culpability makes them the most deser deserving of execution. There is a lot of case law that goes into the different factors and they're outlined in our brief and our brief is quite lengthy so I won't go through all of them. But the common theme and the common thing that we see and through a line of cases that have um, helped drive and create the death penalty procedures that we have in place now in each state, we see the common theme that it is supposed to be an individualized sentencing. The jury hears penalty information, um, including the aggravating and the mitigating circumstances. And we see time and time again where case law references that it is to be in an individualized capacity, taking into account the culpability of the offender, their participation in the crimes themselves, as well as the mitigating information. The mitigating factors are unique to each individual. Um, and so when we talk about similarly situated co-defendants or similarly, similarly situated defendants in general, that's usually, they are gonna factor in all of those things. It isn't just limited to the culpability. There is some case law that talks about comparative culpability, but the majority of the case law cited in the defendant's motion deals with felony murder cases. There are a few that deal with conspiracy, but by and large, the bulk of the case law deals with felony murder, wherein individuals set out to commit one crime and someone is killed during the commission of that crime. In Tyson v. Arizona, or Tyson v. Arizona, 481 U.S. 137, a 1987 Supreme Court case, they specifically talk about the two factors that are determined, um, that are looked at when imposing death. And those include the deterrence, the potential deterrence, and the retribution um, that are two purposes that are advanced by the imposition. And they cite to the Edmonds case, and the Edmonds case was a felony murder case, they determined that the, the main factor that they considered in the Edmonds case was that the defendant that had been sentenced to death did not intend or have the purpose to take a life. And they found in that case that it wouldn't be a deterrent to execute someone that had no intention to take a life. We find ourselves in a very different situation here based on the state's theory of the case the state's theory with the conspiracy is that absolutely lives were intended to be taken and not one, but three. When we look at the defendant's argument that he is being unfairly punished or potentially unfairly punished, and I think the state has raised before that we do not believe that these type of motions are ripe um, based on Schaffer v. Reno, that's an 11th Circuit case, 55 F3D 1517, that um, indicates Eighth Amendment claims are not ripe when raised prior to actual or immediately pending imposition. I recognize the court has provided some differing authority on that, and we had a uh, differing on that in the co-defendant's case. However, none of the cases cited by the defendant include cases where there was a predetermination made with regard to the death penalty. All of the cases cited and all the cases cited and found by the state deal with a review conducted after the imposition of the death penalty, where a court was in a position to review all of the evidence presented, the findings made, looking at the mitigating, the aggravating factors, and or if a co-defendant was sentenced differently, why that occurred, and making that as a full determination in being able to review whether or not the death penalty was disproportionate or arbitrary and capricious in his imposition. I think we are well before even being, a, being in a position to try to make that determination. And looking at some of the cases that deal with some constitutional rights or choices given a defendant, um, we have U.S. v. Jackson, 390 U.S. 570. In that case, it was different because the statute was set out in such a way that a defendant had to choose between a jury trial and if they chose a jury trial, there was the potential of a death sentence being imposed. If they chose a bench trial, there was no potential for a death sentence to be imposed. And the courts in that case said, 
that isn't fair. You're penalizing someone for exercising a constitutional right by choosing to go to jury. Now there's the potential for death and they found that to be unconstitutional. Um, turning to State v. Lopez 144, Idaho 349, that provides that a defendant's waiver of speedy trial is a voluntary relinquishment or abandonment of a known right. State v. Youngblood 117, Idaho 160, went on to find that a knowing waiver, a knowing written waiver, is dispositive of a later motion to dismiss based on a defendant's waiver of speedy trial. There's no question the defendant in this case absolutely waived his right to a speedy trial. It is different from U.S. v. Jackson because when he chose to waive the speedy trial, there was nothing contingent upon his waiving that and the death penalty being pulled or being imposed. And I think the court previously made reference to that. The state announced the decision to seek the death penalty in the timely manner as required pursuant to statute and prior to the defendant opting to waive his right to a speedy trial. The potential imposition of the death penalty is in no way linked to his waiver of speedy trial. I know the defendant tries to argue that it is because the co-defendant, by not waiving her speedy trial, ultimately ended up um, making an argument and a successful argument to get the death penalty removed from her side of the case. The defendant at that time didn't opt to ask to have his motion to sever reconsidered. He didn't opt to ask to reconsider the motion to continue the trial. He didn't at that time try to join in a motion arguing in any way he was being unfairly treated or penalized for waiving his right to a speedy trial. Instead, her case went through trial. He had the benefit of observing that trial and has now brought some motions based on his observations of that trial. And only now is trying to bring this as a reason to have the death penalty pulled from his case. Um, in Spanziano v. Beck, 468 U.S. 447, Similarly, a defendant was given a choice. He could waive his right to statute of limitations on, an, uh, on a lesser included offense and have the jury instructed on both what would be a capital offense and what would be a lesser included, or he could move forward with just the capital offense. He opted not to waive his right um, to that statute of limitations on the underlying offense, and the court found he chose to knowingly not waive that right. And when death was imposed, they determined that it was appropriate. Similar in this case, there is no question that Mr. Daybell, the defendant, absolutely opted to waive his right to a speedy trial. He had other remedies he could ask for, but the state's position would be in no way is the potential imposition of death linked to the defendant's waiver of speedy trial. The California Supreme Court in People v. Holmes, McLean v. Newborn, 12 Cal 5th 719, and also 503P3D668 states, it is well established that the punishment meted out to a co-defendant is irrelevant to the decision the jury must make at the penalty phase, whether the defendant before it should be sentenced to death. Again, that would follow the line of cases and the reiteration that when we're dealing with imposition of a sentence, it is individualized and specifically with imposition or the potential imposition of a death sentence, it is supposed to be an individualized consideration. That clearly indicates the jury is not supposed to consider what happened in a co-defendant's case or what the sentence may have been in that case. The Ninth Circuit Court in Paradis v. Arave, 20 F3D 950, and that's a Ninth Circuit from 1999, found the Supreme Court has determined that the death penalty is not a disproportionate punishment for those who kill, attempt to kill, intend to kill, intend that lethal force, lethal force, force be applied or act with reckless indifference to human life while playing a major role in the felony that results in the murder. Again, most of the cases cited deal with culpability as to each individual defendant involving felony murders rather than conspiracies. There are a few um, that were cited to and that deal specifically with conspiracies. And those include Lar Zellier, I'm going to say that wrong, I'm sure, V State. And it's a Florida Supreme Court case, um, citation 676. South 2D 394, and it's from 1996. And they determined that where there was a conspiracy, a co-defendant 
that it was appropriate for her to be given the sentence of death, given the fact that it was determined that she was more culpable and that she was a mastermind and driving force behind a murder that was done for financial gain. Even though there were two others that were not charged and one co-defendant that was acquitted, the court upheld her death sentence as appropriate. In this case, when we talk about relative culpability, and I won't rehash it too much because it's been hashed out, but one thing that I will indicate with regard to the defendant is he has an additional count of first degree murder over and above what his co-defendant has. He also has two counts of insurance fraud over and above what his co-defendant had. Those are specifically in relation to the death and the homicide of his wife, Tammy Dayville. When we look at that Florida court case, we're in a similar situation where the state's theory would be he was absolutely a moving, driving force behind that homicide and that it was done for financial gain. And while the co-defendant was charged in the conspiracy, he does in fact face an additional charge. In looking at People v. Kleiner, it's an Illinois Supreme Court. Court case 185, or actually I'll give the other citation, 705 Northeast 2D 850, a 1998 case. And basically, again, that's talking about that when we're looking at an individual sentence, we have to look at the nature of the fence, offense, each individual's relative involvement or culpability, the defendant's character or background, including any criminal record, and the potential for rehabilitation. In that case, they had determined that it was appropriate to give a trigger man a death sentence where the co-defendant who initiated the plan was not given a death sentence. The co court upheld that in part given the background of the two. And again, could not be considered until all the evidence was presented and before a jury. One of the other major differences with most of the cases cited is um, they were not cases in which both co-defendants went to a trial. They were not cases in which the court pre one of the defendants going to trial had pulled the death penalty as a potential sentence. They are generally cases where a plea deal was taken or cases in which both went to trial and ended up with different sentences from their respective juries. The Idaho Supreme Court in State v. Gibson, 106 Idaho 54, it's a Supreme Court case from 1983, found that the death penalty is not an unduly severe punishment for an aider and a better to a murder when that person intends that a killing takes place. Again, we see that intend language again and again in a lot of these cases and their review of it. What did the defendant intend that a homicide take place? In this case, again, the state's theory is absolutely the defendant intended for three homicides to take place, not just one. And again, when we talk about the culpability, I would just reiterate, contrary to the position raised by the defense, the state's theory of the case and belief has always been that Lori Vallow Daybell, the co-defendant, and the defendant here today manipulated not only those around them, but each other, and that they did so with a common goal in mind, that goal of being together. To ultimately achieve that goal, it included the ending of three people's lives and had the underlying goals as well of financial gain and to end lust. So the state's position would be several things. One, that it would be premature to even make a determination if the court were to even consider that death should be pulled for any of the reasons outlined by the defendant at this juncture, that we would be premature until we see all the evidence presented and are able to weigh everything for the court to make an appropriate culpability analysis and relative culpability specifically. In addition to that, um, that would be if the court found any grounds to even consider that. The state's review of the case law and is as more clearly outlined in our brief would be that the defendant fails to provide any valid reason or grounds or case law to support this court being required to remove the death penalty as an option. And to the contrary, that if the state has brought the death penalty, that it should be the jurors who make a final determination whether or not this crime or the crimes alleged are of such a nature that regardless of any mitigating evidence presented to them, that the imposition of the death penalty is appropriate. So we would ask that the court deny these motions at this at this time. Thank you. Right. Ms. Blake, on the premature argument then, are you asking the court to defer ruling? 
Our initial ask, and I probably said that backwards, our initial ask is that these just simply be denied. We think there are no grounds or basis or valid case law provided to support them. In the event that the court was going to consider either of these um, in any capacity, we believe that it would be premature to make that determination until the court makes a finding regarding culpability um, and relative culpability of the two. Again, as we outlined, Mr. Daybell, the defendant here today, has some additional charges that the co-defendant did not. We think with regard to the waiver of speedy trial, that in no way is even linked to the potential imposition of the death penalty or reason to pull the death penalty as an option. With regard to the relative culpability, if the court were to consider that one at all, we think it's premature until all of the evidence is presented in the defendant's trial, including through the penalty phase. For the court to make a proper determination. We think it could be denied today simply because we don't think that it fits within the line of cases presented regarding, um, generally speaking, the felony murders. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. So if it were a deferred ruling, your uh, argument based on the case law you've reviewed would be the deferral is post-conviction and then after the penalty phase? Yes, that would be, and I would also know, I don't think I had indicated this, but the Idaho um, statutes actually already provide for an automatic review regarding a death penalty and whether or not the imposition was appropriate. Idaho Code 192827, it specifically states whenever the death penalty is imposed and upon the judgment becoming final in the trial court, the sentence shall be reviewed on the record by the Supreme Court of Idaho. So I think there actually is already a built-in review um, to make a determination whether or not the imposition of the death penalty is appropriate, which is the other reason that we would say this is premature to raise today. All right. Well, I appreciate the clarification on that point. Mr. Pryor, you've heard the state's response to your two final motions. If you'd like to offer any rebuttal argument on either, you may at this time. Judge, I will be extremely brief. I just want to point out uh, just a couple of things. Judge, the... Um, at the time of the uh, uh, failure to provide adequate disclosure, uh, the only difference between Ms. Uh, Vallow and Mr. Daybell was that Mr. Va Mr. Daybell waived his right to a speedy trial. Now she's correct, it was a valid waiver of a speedy trial. They timely provided the notice of the death penalty, but the sanction that was imposed on the state for this failure was the pulling of the death penalty. That was not an option for Mr. Daybell. And what the culpability issue goes, goes to judge is simply this, is that if we're going to uh, apply Mr. Wood's words about Ms. Vallow's involvement and Mr. Daybell's alleged involvement in this thing, uh, the relative culpability simply is that uh, if Mr. Daybell truly was the, 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 the second wheel or a lesser wheel in this thing and Ms. Daybell was driving the ship, uh, he's being punished for the waiver of his speedy trial. And I'm just for purposes of this uh, motion, Judge, I'm just preserving this for future consideration if there is a, uh, a conviction of any kind, and that can be addressed uh, at, a lever, at a, another court, Judge. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I'll just make a, a final note and comment. I'm gonna take the matter under advisement, but the court would note that at the time I made that ruling uh, on the Lori Vallow case, I also made an explicit finding that the ruling there in no way impacted or affected the ability of the state to still seek the death penalty as it related to this case with Mr. Daybell. So uh, with that in mind, I will take those matters under advisement. The court will issue a written decision on those as well. So that will conclude our argued motions for today. The court will get back with written orders and rulings on those matters under advisement. I appreciate counsel's briefing and arguments this morning and this afternoon. Mr. Wood and Ms. Blake, is there anything further to bring up on the matter today? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? No, Your Honor. Thank you for your consideration All right. today. Thank you. And thanks everyone in attendance for complying with the court's conduct order. I appreciate that as well. We'll be adjourned. All right. Let's see, so I'll wait to hear Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I have some things to say. Okay, let me let me stop sharing. Hold on one second. I'll turn it off here.
but we're not going to see. All right. Okay, they're officially off. I was like, I'm not going to miss any like uh, hot mic stuff. So I kept listening. Okay, we're good. We're good. How's everyone doing? Good? Uh, I was not expecting that today. I mean, did the trial start early or what? Because I felt like that was a day of uh, sitting in court for Lori Vallow Daybell's trial. That was, I think we were just show, we were just shown both of their hands, the prosecutions, the states, as well as chats, the defense. Uh, it's clear that John Pryor is going to continue driving home this idea that Lori was the ringleader and Lori was driving the bus, the religious bus, the murderous bus. We'll talk about that. I have some things to say about that. We learned that cameras are going to be allowed in the courtroom. Uh, at this moment, uh, the death penalty, Chad, uh, facing the death penalty is, is undecided. It, it'll be to be determined. I mean, right now, um, it will be death penalty. You know what else is interesting, too? I just want to point out that John Pryor is not a death penalty attorney. I don't have the answers there, but I, I just want to throw that out, that if Chad Daybell faces the death penalty, I just I don't know what that means. I don't think John Pryor can be lead counsel. So, all right. Um, thank you, Stephanie Budge. If you want to go back and listen to the audio of Lori's trial, you can find it here. A lot was talked about today about their trials. First off, I want to share a few things. Uh, I was looking at my phone to comment when I can, but I was also uh, communicating with a couple of people, and I communicated with Heather Daybell, and she has something that I am allowed to share publicly. Um, when it comes to cameras in the courtroom. So she states, um, while she's not going to be doing any um, interviews pre-trial, she states that I can share this publicly for her. I am grateful and supportive for the judge's ruling for cameras in the courtroom. That takes a burden off of family who wish to watch but cannot be there. So that is how... Uh, family, or at least some family members, feel about Judge Boyce's decision today. I, too, as a journalist, am grateful for Judge Boyce's decision to have cameras in the courtroom. And I want to ask each of you uh, today to be thinking about uh, the best ways you want me to be covering this trial in, as John Pryor taught us, 120 days. So he let us know it's 120 days away. I will be planning to cover every single day of this trial uh, with our community here. And I want to cover that in a way that if you guys know of other channels that have covered trials and you like the way they cover them, let me know. For example, today I had my mic on mute while I listened. If you want commentary, whatever the case may be, just let me know. But, uh, I will be dedicated and here with you. And if the trial is not is televised and continues to be televised, I will most likely just be doing it from my laptop. I don't know if I will be in Idaho or not. I will be with all of you though every day. Let's talk about you know. So so um, I have so many things I want to say. <laughs> I took some notes just in case I, I forget. Yeah, so much publicity in Rexburg. I want to say I agreed. I agreed with Pryor on some stuff. When they're talking about the the trial or the 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 trial being moved uh, back to Fremont County from Ada County, I have my opinions there. Their opinions, um, but Pryor's right that it was a lot more wild in Rexburg, Idaho, in the small town of Rexburg, than it ever was in Ada County. I went every day to trial in Ada County. Uh, no one was camping outside. the The overflow was never once full, even remotely full. Everyone was respectful. Rexburg, again, I flew out there. I didn't even go. Didn't even go. It was, it was, it was actually really disorganized. Uh, I'll, I'll share. Um, there's uh, that was actually another reason I didn't go. I, I didn't go because I felt I could see it better in the live stream, which is also odd, right? It was live streamed, and yet people, everyone still wanted to go. The trial in Boise was not live streamed. There were no cameras, and very few people. Not you know, the courtroom was small. It was filled to capacity each day, but, uh, not that many people came to watch. 
but her sentencing in Rexburg, Idaho, her sentencing was, was full and it was really disorganized outside. Uh, you had civilians passing out numbers and lines that um, then the court okayed. And uh, it just wasn't, it was bizarre. All right. So uh, I, I want to say I agree with uh, prior on that. And in my opinion, and now I can share this in my opinion, I can share that I do not have self-interest in this because I might not now even be traveling for the trial. So before I had some self-interest, I shared that in my breakfast live today, that it would be easier for me to travel to and from Boise because of the the airport. So uh, I'm no longer traveling. I can look at this objectively a little bit better. I do believe that the trial should be held in Ada County for a uh, better jur jury pool for uh, the, and by the way, for all those that think you could not find a juror that didn't know about this case, they found jurors that did not know about this case. We listened to a week of jury, juror questioning and jury selection. They absolutely found jurors that knew very little, if not nothing about this case. And we interviewed one of them here at Hidden True Crime. His name was Tom. You can listen to his interview and Tom and I are still in touch. And, uh, he, he did he did not know about this case. That's going to be a lot more easy to, to do in Boise, Idaho, a big city. And Boise is not only a lot bigger, but it's a very, it's a rapidly growing community. And many people haven't even lived there in Idaho very long in Boise. There is more growth in, in Boise, Idaho than many places in the country right now. You have new people moving in every day. You can find a jury, jury much easier there. Um, but we'll see, you know, judge Boyce doesn't care about my opinion. He cares about the law. So <laughs> I respect that. I'm just sharing my thoughts on it. Uh, Chad and Lori communicating. Can we talk about that? That came down before, before, uh, I read, I read as we were waiting for this uh, hearing to start today that they will be able to be communicate. I love this. I love this. We just learned that Chad Daybell will be throwing Lori under the bus. He's already started. This is, I mean, we're just arguing motions here and it has begun full force, full throttle. Like he is throwing his wife under the bus again and again and again. I hope that those two are talking. We know that Pryor's argument is going to be Lori is the ringleader. Lori ran the bus or, or drove the bus. And so to have their conversations and to be a fly on the wall, I am so curious how Chad will communicate with Lori if that's his defense. I think that you can get some really solid evidence out of some uh, conversations with them or lack of conversations too. What Chad says or what he doesn't say to his wife would be very, very interesting. So uh, for me, I support their communication, because especially now knowing Pryor's arguments, let's hear how uh, Chad manages this on his own when he actually has to speak to his wife. Um. Oh, no. Did I, oh, good. I thought I just deleted all my notes. People brought up a lot of things that Chad Daybell did uh, to that, that were brought up in court during Lori Vallow Daybell's trial. You know what else is interesting about Lori Vallow Daybell's trial? is that many people said that didn't believe that Chad was the ringleader or that it was his belief system or that he was super involved. After listening to that entire trial, they were like, wow, he was so involved. At the very least, a co-conspirator. I mean, it is, he had plans and I want to bring up some of those. Shooting and burying a raccoon, that text he sent. Well, first off, let's go back before the, the text about the raccoon. Lori was not in town when Tammy Daybell was killed. Chad Daybell was in town when his own wife was killed. People also want to say that Chad is more culpable or Lori is more culpable because she is the mother of these children. Chad Daybell is Tammy's husband. These are both their family members. Um, both of them. Chad Daybell was there at the house the night his wife was murdered. And he's charged with first degree murder there. Lori was in Hawaii with Audrey Baratero and Melanie Pulaski. Um, then after 
Uh, then Lori, Lori's phone never pinged when Tylee's body was being burned in Chad Dable's yard. Alex's phone, her brother's pinged and Chad's pinged there. And then right when they concluded the burning, Chad wrote the raccoon text to his wife, Tammy, who was still alive at this time and said that he had just shot a raccoon and they were burning limbs before the coming storm. He was burning limbs before the coming storm. He let his wife know that. Lori didn't. Um, I want to talk about something that Pryor brought up in his motions and, and our moderators brought up too. The This quote from Chad Daybell, it's a text to Lori Vallow and in, it, grab me by the storm and I will follow you to the ends of the earth. This is a really important line because it was, it was brought up in the closing arguments by both the prosecution and the defense at Lori's trial. Uh, it was brought up to show how Lori, you know, ran the bus, drove the bus. I say ran now. It's like, you know, the train sailing, you run the bus and the train sails. Okay. But whatever, the, you know, who was leading this conspiracy? Although the entire definition of conspiracy is, is co they both did. So this, this line grab me by the storm and I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Um, it's becoming quite well known. It's up there with his loin fire story. Um, Chad's got some good one-liners and this is one of them. And it's been used in court over and over again. And uh, making it to to all closing arguments by both Archibald, Lori's counsel, her defense used it to say that it, it shows that this was Chad, that Chad was led by his storm. And then the prosecution used it to say Lori was in charge. She was sexually manipulating Chad. Because for those that don't know what the storm is, you can look at Chad and they'll tell you what the storm means to Chad. Um, I'm just watching my language on YouTube. So also, I just want to point out, so, so, so then Pryor uses this line in his motion to say, Lori is the ringleader. Lori sexually manipulated Chad Daybell. And this is proof. This line is proof. This text that Chad wrote is proof. Grab me by the storm and I will follow you to the ends of the earth. That's what Chad texts Lori. And so, so, so John Pryor, Chad's attorney saying, see, Lori was a sexual manipulator. Well, first, you know, that just like, to me, I just got to say this, that drives me crazy. That is the most sexist argument on the planet. Who owns the storm? Chad. So if you're saying that Lori is the ringleader because she sexually manipulated him, who does the storm belong to? It's Chad's storm. And you're right. It's just, it's a little itty bitty storm, little itty bitty guy, but it's Chad's, not Lori's. And uh, Lori cannot force Chad to text that or to want that or to be led by that or to kill his wife of 30 years because uh, she has that much control. There's only one owner of the little itty bitty storm and it's not Lori. Um, I want to bring that up more. So when was this storm open? Oh, I just lost it. We're going to pull it up though. May 8th. Stay with me. Um, okay. So I lost it cause I, I was holding this on Twitter. I found the day that this storm comment came up and I'm going to find it here right now. Um, I'm pulling up my live tweets. What do we call live tweets now? Cause that, that was brought up in court too. Rob would mention live tweets and he said, or oh, whatever they're called, you know, the, 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 tw the lives formerly known as tweets. I don't know the X's, the live X's I'll probably be on threads during the trial. Just throwing that out there. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to look it up. Follow storm. Okay. May 8th. I pulled it up. We're going to go over this thread together. We're going to read it. So I was live tweeting. We're going to call it live tweeting for nostalgia's sake. And, uh, we're going to go through what happened that day, how it came up. Let's go through the context. So this May 8th was a big day. It was an emotional day. It was a heartbreaking day. And this is when this line came up in court that we learned that Chad texted Lori to say, uh, you know, grab me by the storm and I will follow you to the ends 
of the earth. So let's go through that. Let's get context to that line and decide for ourselves who is in charge here. So it starts with objections. The defense argues about an exhibit. It was a very boring beginning. Here we go. Judge Boyce will review the exhibits and the witnesses take the stand. Jury is now in court. Smith continues to exa with examining, examining of FBI agent Doug Hart. So Hart, Doug Hart is on the stand. He's an FBI agent and they are going to discuss text exchanges. The texts continue from Lolly Time and Lori for Style iCloud. Those are all the texts uh, they found on Lori's iCloud accounts. This is 7 15. 2019. And then let me, let me say that date again, 7, 15, 2019. What happened on 7, 11, 2019, Charles Valla was murdered, murdered. So 11, 12, 13, 14, we're talking three days later, three days later now is this text. Okay. So here's the text exchange three days after Charles Valla was murdered this hex exchange happens. 7, 15, 2019 from Chad to Lori. My love for you is overflowing. I want to hold you endlessly. You are my wonderful best friend that I cannot live without. Three days after his, her husband's killed in Arizona. Lori responds to Chad on 7, 15, 2019. I just got a letter from insurance saying I am not the beneficiary through to Charles's insurance. It is a spear through my heart. 718 Chad to Lori. So now we're five days after Charles Vallow's killed. So, so Chad responds to this. This is terrible, but it's probably another step and bringing down the Gadiantans, especially Brandon. The Gadiantan robbers are a wicked people in the Book of Mormon. So Chad is suggesting what this is all about. Lori has a spear through her heart because she doesn't get Charles Fallow's life insurance money. But Chad is saying to her, it's probably another step in bringing down the Gadiantans, especially Brandon, Brandon Boudreaux. So he's evil. So, so Chad is bringing up that Brandon is evil, like a Gaddy Anton robber. 718 continues. 718, 2019. A lot of lovey dovey intermixed with how Charles was possibly changed. Oh, possibly changed the insurance before his death. And then from Chad to Lori. Hmm. It will be interesting if the insurance got changed after he had two bullets in his chest. Chad Daybell said that. That wasn't Lori. That was Chad Daybell. From Chad to Lori on 7 18, 2019. So we're talking less than a week after Charles is killed, or a week, a week after Charles is killed. It will be interesting if it got changed after he had two bullets in his chest. Chad knew how many bullets went through Charles. Lori confirms to Chad that Charles changed insurance in March before his July death. Hart explains who the Gandiantans are and that it denotes evil. 718, Chad to Lori. I have been instructed to focus my efforts on Hillary, so I will kissy face emoji. Hillary is a zombie name of Tylee. So on 718, Chad is letting Lori know he has been instructed, I assume by God, to focus his efforts on Hillary, and so I will with a kissy face emoji to Lori. Lori to Chad. Okay, find out her percentage for me and find out the percentage of JJ. Chad to Lori. He lets her know. Well, she, Hillary, is at a 0.13 I turned up the pain to 10 and I placed a spiritual virus in her. As far as JJ, he is at a 99.99. 99. 
Raphael, a.k.a. Chad, visited him and told him to follow Amy into the light. I also assured JJ that James, also Chad, would love and take care of his mommy, which he will with all of his heart and soul, end quote. So Chad just told Lori that he turned up the pain on Tylee and put a spiritual virus on her, and she's at a 0.13, which means closer to death. Heart will tell you that in a second. Then he lets Lori know that he's going to love Lori with all his heart, and he's going to let JJ know that so he can you know, feel okay. Lori to Chad responds to that message. This is sweet. I miss you desperately. Heart now says, in quotes, the closer someone was to zero, the closest, the closer they were to death. So Tylee is at a 0.13. This is before her move to Rexburg, guys. So now we're talking premeditated with both of them. We're talking a week after Charles's death, that Chad is letting Lori know that Tylee is very close to death and that he's upping her pain. Hart also explains that Raphael and James are two names that Chad references for himself. On 7-18-2019 at 8.40 p.m., you are so, and this is Chad to Lori, you are so adorable, beautiful, heavenly, luscious, angelic, so many divine attributes rolled into one dynamic, desirable package. I want you more desperately than you want me, end quote which also, oh my gosh, that like, that raises my blood pressure reading that any person that is so passively aggressively looking for validation, I want you more desperately than you want me End quote. So he's asking Lori to stroke his ego right now, or, you know, or his storm or both. Please let me know that she says, I want you even more desperately that you want me. Chad to Lori. Then here we go. Chad to Lori admits what he really wants. Here's the line. Just grab me by the storm, Chad's you know what, and I will follow you to the ends of the earth, end quote. From Lori to Chad, and then what? From Lori to Chad, back to crying and saying goodbye, back to the box? Chad responds to Lori. Oops, Chad responds to Lori. Oh, I just found it. Stay with me, guys. We're finding our place on the live tweets. Chad to Lori explains after Lori says that this trip to Utah had a lot of finality to it. I was told, Chad explains, that extreme changes are coming for me and to Utah. I welcome them both. End quote. On 720, so now we're at about nine days after Charles's death, Lori to Chad asks, what is Blake's percentage? Blake is Melanie Boudreaux's little child. Lori to Chad, in quotes, well, he threw, oh, and then Lori to Chad again explaining why she's asking. Blake drew three crosses on the wall on his bedroom. We just finished painting over them like he was marking it for the dark side to find him. Chad to Lori, Blake is at a seven. I took my sword of light and sliced his aura. Chad to Lori, I also decreased Blake's pain tolerance to 1%, and I greatly increased Blake's pain. His desire to depart is at 80%. End quote. And then they continue. Then they continue to talk about Rhonda. Rhonda is Kay Woodcock. That's her zombie name. Lori, uh, Chad says about Rhonda, we will work hard on Rhonda. And then when we are together, I will get her numbers. Lori, good. Let's work on it hard. And then on 7 21, 2019, a couple days later, James and Elena, those are Lori, that's Lori and Chad, Chad and Lori, James and Elena, those are their love story names, had agreed to visit the temple the following morning, the LDS temple. 
She returned to the hotel room, and after additional romance on the couch, they calmed their nerves enough to give each other a blessing. End quote. And then we get into the love story. Quotes that Chad sent Lori. That all happened in the same week that he told Lori to grab him by the storm, and he would follow her to the ends of the earth. So if you want to know who's in charge and who is driving the bus or running the bus or sailing the train or, you know, whatever you want to call it, I'm pretty sure it's both of them. So if this is going to be Pryor's argument, and let me, let me be more specific. Char Pryor is arguing right now. Uh, he's citing a Supreme Court case that I missed. I'm going to go look into it. Pryor is arguing that because of the state's arguments, saying that Lori was the ringleader, thus they have to stick to their arguments. That That's essentially the argument that Pryor is making. But the undertone and what we're hearing is this is going to be Pryor's argument that Lori is the ringleader and that she is driving the bus. But I think from that line alone, grab me by the storm and I will follow you to the ends of the earth. The context of even that line shows us that Lori is not the ringleader here and that they have been charged as co-conspirators for a reason. This is going to be a very, very interesting trial. So those are some things I wanted to share before we ended here. It was a really big day for the, for, for the Daybell trial today, a lot bigger day than I thought or intended. So I'm going to sign off and um, process a lot, but I, but I wanted to share that. Thank you to everyone who has been here. I've been here last minute, was here last minute. Um, so, and thank you to the well wishes for our family right now. John and I will share a little bit more later, but we appreciate it during this time. And it was so wonderful hanging out with our amazing gems. I agree. I agree. Um, it's been good. So you guys are mentioning some other things. When you can, can you remember when Chad kind of cut off Lori in a text until she did what he wanted? Yes, I do. I do. I do. He sits there so small, so still, so wax like. He hardly breathes. I'm going to be asking Dr. John about that too. And uh, that's been his persona his whole life. Uh, before he was arrested, before children were found in his yard. Let's remember where the children were found, his yard. People said he's such a humble guy. He's so quiet. There's no way. He's innocent. He's innocent. That's the man he's playing sitting in that chair right now. Quiet, silent, small. His store might be small, but we all know what he's guilty of. So, well, we don't. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that word. He's innocent until proven guilty. We all know the evidence that they showed us in court. And I will be interested in listening to Pryor's evidence that he brings. Again, what Pryor is arguing right now, and he's attempting to argue right now, is that the prosecution needs to stick to their arguments. And in that sense, Pryor's right. The prosecution and the state's arguments that they had for his co-conspirator at her trial, Lori's trial last year, they do need to stick to their arguments. Pryor has that right. According to Judge Boyce, they are sticking to those arguments. So um, it'll be really interesting, really interesting, the evidence. I also suspect we're going to have a lot more evidence when it comes to Chad's trial. So to be determined. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And we will talk soon again. We'll see you.